Hi, thank you. Welcome to the March Advisory Board of the Housing Opportunity Fund. Um, it is customary that we start with public comment. Gloria, did anyone sign for public comment? Would anyone from the public like to speak prior to the meeting starting? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, we also have opportunity at the end of the meeting for public comment. So we will call roll. Lena Andrews. Here. Jamil Bay. Jamil, he's on the phone. Um, I'm on, uh, yes, I'm present. <laughs> Richard Butler. Present. Kyle Chinalopoli. Here. Joanna Deming. Here. Jerome Jackson, not here. Teresa Kale Smith, not here. Majestic Lane, not here. Mark Masterson. Here. Valerie McDonald Roberts. Here. Leslie Springs, not here. Samuel Sue. Here. Sonia Tillman. Here. Derek Tillman. Here. Carlos Torres. Demonte Walker. Adrian Wanahall. Here. Thank you. We do have a quorum established. Review and acceptance of minutes. Did everyone see the minutes? Move to approve. Second. Um, just real one one quick note on the minutes. The version that was emailed yesterday, um, I realized didn't have um, funding amounts for, for Wood Street Commons and for the program administrators listed in the recommendations. The revised version you have at your um, spot does have that, and, and that'll be the final version going into the minutes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Okay, so so Sonia Stain. And and for the record, Jerome Jackson um, is present as well. Okay, so um, today we have a pretty long agenda uh, with some recommendation items at the beginning and then some update items um, and just talking about moving forward in the future um, towards the end of it. So we will start with the um, recommendation to approve uh, contracts and agreements with the following not-for-profit program administrators to help administer the housing stabilization program. Um, so I'll give a little bit of context on this and, and then we'll talk about the program administrators. But this is the program to provide emergency rental assistance the RFP was issued in January. It was due on February 19th. Uh, we received six responses. Um, there are five here today. The total responses totaled a million five hundred, um, and we have seven hundred and fifty thousand in the line item. So we received twice as many responses as was able to allocate. Uh, therefore, a committee was established. Um, there were a couple of advisory board members on the committee, uh, Diamante Walker, Adrian Wanahall, and Mark Masterson. And there was also representatives from the Department of Human Services and the United Way and the URA staff um, that reviewed uh, the applications um, in detail, talked about them, um, made the recommendation that uh, there was one um, Chartier's housing that was an extremely small request, um, I think of $49,000. And given the administrative um, burden and just needing to have this as a pilot year, um, it seemed like um, it would be something to talk to them about in the future and maybe next year, you know, they can work on their application and uh, potentially increase it. Um, so given that, we took the other five and um, worked with them over this past week. Staff called them, had a meeting with them, um, and, and, you know, asked a lot of questions and came with these revised amounts for funding. Um, so going through, through them, Macedonia Face is located in the Hill District. They had requested 275,000. The recommendation is 105,000. They run a couple of programs with the Department of Human Services for, through the Children, Youth, and Family Program. Um, but they have not administered any of DHS, DHS's um, direct homeless prevention programs. 
but the program they do administer for Children, Youth, and Family Services is um, a program where they work with households prior to them entering a crisis stage. Um, and they saw a lot of synergy between housing stability and, and the families they, they work with. They work uh, primarily in the Hill District, but, they're, but they do have outreach throughout the whole city um, and do not turn clients down if they are not in the Hill District. Uh, Mercy Life Center Corporation um, is called Pittsburgh Mercy. Um, their legal name is Mercy Life Center Corporation. And they are uh, a citywide organization that has um, several uh, facilities that they operate and um, homeless shelters, but also operate uh, emergency programs through the Department of Human Services. Um, they requested 400,000 and um, the suggestion to the advisory board is a, is a reduction down to 200,000. Neighborhood legal services responded to the portion of the RFP that is specific to eviction um, legal services and working with tenants um, once they actually do receive the eviction notice. The, the plan is really for the other four administrators to work with tenants prior to that. Um, but if tenants do have an eviction notice and need the legal assistance that was included in the RFP and Neighborhood Legal Services was the only respondent for that portion of the RFP and they did respond with 100 and I think 39.99. Um, so we're awarding them 140, or we're, we're, the suggestion to the advisory board would be to award them 140,000. The Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh is an established social service provider in the city. Um, that have that has operated uh, rental assistance programs through DHS for for quite a while, um, and they applied for four. Let's see, they applied for four hundred thousand, and and the uh, suggestion to the advisory board is two hundred thousand. And uh, finally, the Young Women's Christian Association uh, (YWCA) of Pittsburgh. Um, also applied. They have also um, worked with DHS on several um, housing programs over the years as well. And their request was 250, um, with a reduction down to 105. So um, I don't know if, if we should open up to questions. I some of the providers are in the room. I know Neighborhood Legal Services is in the back of the room. Are any of the other providers? Can you stand up and state your name and organizations? Good morning. I'm Dr. And can you guys? And if the advisory board does have any questions for you, I'm going to ask for you to come up to the microphone so they can get it on video. So I'll open it up for questions. Just a general question, um, Jessica. In the amounts that they requested, what were those figures based off of? Is it demonstrated need? Is it projected need? And right. um, as a follow-up to that, are, are, is there clarity sort of on any overlap that may sort of happen in coming up with those numbers. Right, so so this is something we looked at. Um, everyone had a different per household amount that they were focusing on, and the numbers were different, I mean, pretty different. Like one organization who's asking for 400,000 might help 300 and another might help 200, and it's yeah. based on their service model of delivery. Um, so one agency might average just 1500 per household, but another agency who intends to do a little more, you know, intensive outreach, you know, might average a little bit more than that. And so that's why we met with all the providers um, in the room on Tuesday and started to talk through this. And they're giving us some revised statements as to with these, these recommended amounts, how many households do they plan on helping of what income tiers um, and so we can start to compare apples to apples mm -hmm. a little bit more. Um, for example, the Urban League, they um, 
really requested that most of their funds come out of the pot for 50% AMI, 30 to 50%, because that tends to be their clients more so that need a little bit of help with, with monthly rent, but, you know, are semi-stable or just have, a, you know, more emergency crises where some of the others who are working with clients more at the lower income tier have stated that they would put, the you know, most of the funding in the lower income tier. So those details are going to need to be worked out prior to entering into contracts. Other questions from the advisory board? Go ahead, sorry. Um, what outreach is going to be done, you know, to make sure that the entire city is covered, not just like the people that are in the, that these yes. organizations know? Um, and is it a two-step process for the application? Will they need to come to the URA and then go here, or will they go directly? No. So <laughs> with, with the other programs, they all need to go through the URA, but with this program, what we've talked about is there, there could be several front doors to this program. Um, we want to make sure as many people can get there as possible. So um, we have met at length with United Way. They have been a tremendous partner through this. Um, several of the staff went to tour the 211 call center and um, they are gonna list the providers that are through this program in the 211 call center. So if the description that the people give the, the person on the phone you know, seems to fit this program, they will refer them to one of these service providers. Additionally, we have worked with the Department of Human Services and um, they are talking with the Allegheny County link to figure out if the operators there can also refer people to this program uh, with Allegheny County link. It's more based on, you know, we're going to be homeless like really soon. Um, and so if people call and just say, I can't pay my rent this month, but I haven't received an eviction notice yet that they would then refer folks to this program. The URA, we also, of course, will be a front door if people call us, we will get them into the programs. And if um, any of the social service providers, you know, have people come directly to them. Those are the ways we're envisioning it right now, but any other way um, that that you can think of, please let us know. Is there a way to put this on the URA's website where we have a link on the Housing Opportunity Fund that says if you're experiencing housing stabilization issues, here are our service yeah, providers? Absolutely. And then that could be that could also be a pipeline to these agencies? Yes. Those are good. I think <clears throat> we're going to get to later some more um, outreach, talking a little bit more about outreach, and I think mm -hmm. probably some more grassroots work would complement you know, these other systems. Yep. <clears throat> so I can just share with the group, when HPRP launched in 2009, um, there was a notice that was put in the newspaper, and within, I think it was 11 days, there were 1,500 referrals. Wow. So <laughs> outreach is, is, one of, is definitely, I think, something that we need to talk about across all of the programs mm -hmm. that are launched, but I think we also need to be cognizant of how much of a resource is available when we're talking about the outreach strategies mm -hmm. because the system was really overwhelmed when it was such a public launch with a new program and there was definitely not funds to to serve those numbers i think the original target for that program for the year was 800 and 1500 people within 11 days wow. were on deck so so we know that there's a need we know that there's a need that's so well beyond any resources that we put on the street um, so i think we want as many people to be able to take advantage as possible but also don't want to create a scenario where the system is completely overwhelmed and then people can't be served in a good way adrian that that program was it county-wide though because we're talking city specific yeah. so it, it that, was yeah, county-wide okay. but I mean, sure. in, in an 11-day period to have 1,500 yep. people materialize for rental assistance was not what was expected. Yeah. The um, I think that we finally shut the waiting list down at 2,300. Okay. And yes, it was a it was a county program. Okay. But even if you took that in half, that's yeah. still a lot of folks. So I mean, it's just a balance with all of these programs. We want the widest group of people to be able to take advantage, but we also have to be cognizant of the fact that the resources are limited, and not to do a kind of outreach that that doesn't help the people who really need the service. Yeah. I mean, in part, that was sort of what my question was in terms of the request, right? Like, mm -hmm. what were those figures sort of based on, like, 
was it actual demand, you know, from from the experience, or was it sort of presumed demand or projected demand, and more sort of thinking of our task of figuring out what do we do in 2019, mm -hmm. um, and, and and an allocation amount that makes sense. So, um, yeah, that's helpful to hear. Maybe something we want to look at for the next allocation plan if we have capacity to spend more money and we have demand people that need it you know then we need to um, note that for next year's mm -hmm. allocation mm -hmm. <clears throat> anything else someone bring a motion to the table motion to approve second all those in favor aye, aye. aye. <clears throat> motion carry oh to sam you to abstain Anyone else need to abstain? I'm sorry, I should have asked um, a question. Yeah, I I, uh, I need to abstain from Macedonia State specifically just because of the affiliation, but I think the work they do is great. Um, but uh, everyone else, um, you know, I'm voting in favor of. Okay. So we have two abstentions, Gloria. Um, okay, so I think the motion carried. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thanks to all the providers that are in the room. Um, the next item. Um, just to, uh, yes. as a follow-up to that, mm -hmm. one of the things that we talked about um, was sort of a broader need for uh, some services that maybe neighborhood legal can provide and how we're going to do that and whether that's an appropriate administrative function and not coming out of this limited pot. Um, I, I, so. Uh, I can see that we're going to need their help with some tangled title issues when we're doing uh, homeowner um, repair loans that we want to be sure that there's a, uh, uh, a will or something in there that doesn't lead to a tangled title with property that we've touched. And, you know, I think it, maybe that's not this year's uh, discussion, but certainly next year or maybe for part of this year we need to be talking about that. Is that that's a need that we're going to have with most of the consumer facing programs that we've got so uh, it's that it, it brought it up at the subcommittee meeting but mm -hmm. I think we would need to be thinking about that mm -hmm. yeah that's a really good point you know as we move forward figuring out which line items you know would be the best line items to take these services out of if, if it is administration or if it is the programs themselves um, that's a good segue into the next yeah. item as well, <laughs> because this is Mark related to legal services mm -hmm. for, for another program, which is the Homeowner Assistance Program. Um, and as part of that RFP that was issued, I think, in December, um, there was a couple paragraphs in the RFP related to tangled title assistance. Um, so assistance for folks that apply to the program that get turned down because their name is not on the deed um, to to fix up their home. Once again, this is the owner-occupied um, homeowner repair program. For If their name is not on the deed, uh, what ideally we would like to have happen is to have um, some place to refer them to to take the property through probate, get their name on the deed so that they could then apply to the program. Um, so when we issued the RFP um, last month, we took the six uh, construction responses to the RFP um, and had not received a legal response, but reissued the RFP as rolling and uh, received a legal response a, a few weeks ago from Neighborhood Legal Services to provide um, the assistance with helping folks go through probate and um, working with the Tangle title. So the action in front of you today, and just up on the screen, you can see the awards real quick that were made last month. And uh, in yellow is the Neighborhood Legal Services Award. If you remember, the, the full line item um, is 2.3, I think, or 2.275. Um, but uh, with, with Neighborhood Legal Services, we will have a uh, million seven thirty of it issued. Um, the RFP was actually issued stating we would um, give contracts up to, I think, 1.875 just to leave some funds available for emergencies that the URA could transact with quickly, um, emergency housing situations. 
Um, so we're going to start with these contracts, but I just want to let the board know that moving forward, you know, there would be room for new partners to come on board or to extend people's contracts across the board um, with the 2018 line item. But the request today is for the 130000 to go to neighborhood legal services to, um, to help uh, families go through probate. I mean, can, can, can we have a representative from Neighborhood Legal Services maybe speak very briefly as to what that would look like and what the average cost is per household to go through probate? Good morning. My name is Tom McPoyle. I'm an attorney who uh, works on the uh, Tangled Title Program with Neighborhood Legal Services and Gabrielle. Uh, Antonia Jolly, uh, our assistant, uh, like paralegal, who's uh, who's really here to uh, uh, correct all the mistakes I'm going to make here in the next uh, 30 <laughs> seconds. Okay, uh, but as far as the expenses, part of our program, of course, to to be even represented by Neighborhood Legal Services, uh, there is an income limit for our clients of uh, on this program. I believe it's 187.5 of the. Uh, medium income and um, so that gets them in the program and at that income level they're, they're eligible for certain fees being waived in the court system that we have. Not inheritance tax, not all fees are waived. For example, inheritance tax would have to be paid uh, by the uh, client but some of the filing fees and, uh, and the like. And as for an average cost, it's, it's difficult to say because there can be more complexities with some cases than with others, depending on how many possible legal errors there would be, you know, uh, maybe more people to contact, more individuals to, to meet with, more time spent, you know, by our staff uh, on those matters. But the procedures are somewhat similar, okay, in that we have to uh, first identify, you know, the rela relationship between our client and the property, okay? We have to establish that, and we have to identify all possible errors that could be also could also have a legal claim that are not our clients okay we have publishing expenses uh into uh you know different publications legal journal and a, uh, a general uh publication the courier for example and that has to be three weeks uh running once each week in both and then there's uh, a posting notice that goes on the property we have to identify any liens that are on the property. We have to, you know, so there's, there's a somewhat of a, an investigation that goes on, and, and then the court proceedings are involved with, uh, you know, a petition before the court, opportunity for people to be heard, um, and ultimately getting to the point where we have established our client has a legal claim to the exception of anyone else. And only then can we put their name on a deed. And you mentioned the benefit of that as far as availability to uh, funds, but it's also important to realize in doing, establishing that legal ownership through their name on the deed, it also helps to maintain family stability because now the, the house is in the family and it can be passed down to another family member, for example, or sold for the benefit of the family if that's their choice too. I don't know if that helps, mm -hmm. but uh, um, Gabrielle? For, for most of our cases, we expect the average cost in a perfect scenario, ideal client, no complications, which you know is Where's not, is not typical. Uh, but in, in that kind of case, we would expect around 1,200 in associated fees that covers the recording fee to record the order once we have it, the cost of um, requesting a certified copy of the order through our Orphan's Court clerks, it covers the advertisement fee in both a general circulation and legal journal. In Allegheny County, we use the Courier and the um, Allegheny County Bar Association legal journal, 
And then we also apply for title insurance at the conclusion of the process so that they will have a marketable title and be able to transfer that title. And that fee ranges based on the size of the estate and the um, property value, but I've seen it go anywhere from $500 to $800. We also cover that out of the fund so that in those cases where the client decides it's in their best interest to pursue perhaps a cash for keys option, to transfer the property down the line, to sell the property down the line, they can do that without having to pay that out of pocket later on. So ideal case, ideal scenario, we estimate roughly $1,200 per case. And that's not counting attorney hour time or staffing time. Which we, of course, do not charge the clients for. Okay. And if I might, it's, it's rare that there's a clean case. It's just a tangled title matter. Often it even comes to their attention that there is this issue because they're facing a foreclosure matter or a, a bankruptcy or, or something else uh, actually uh, brings this matter to, the, to their uh, attention. So we have to address those issues as well. I have a question. It's, <clears throat> it's really off the wall, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> For the um, <clears throat> very um, profitable uh, title companies that we have, um, and we know the big ones that are used, and I'm sure you interact with them. Is there, have there, has there ever been a consideration or is there a charitable arm, a charitable facet to acquiring title insurance, which is basically going through the liens yeah. and giving them clear title? So currently we have a deal with First American Title. We have pursued different pro bono options for title, and based on the fact that it is a very profitable large corporation ordeal, we haven't had success having it completely pro bono. However, through First American, we were able to secure a free title search at the onset of our case so that we are aware of any liens as long as we are committed to purchasing the policy for our client at the conclusion of the case. Any other ones? Chicago? I mean, Currently, just First American. Um, our other organization, not ours, but an organization in Philadelphia called Philly VIP partners with Chicago Title, and they do pro bono work in Philadelphia. We are hoping we could swing that in Pittsburgh, but it just yeah. hasn't happened yet. That's something that we need to push for. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> question. Um, the title insurance, is that separate from the 1200 or is that included in the, in the cost of 1200 Included. It's included? Okay. And then also my other question is, um, once you, you help your clients uh, with the tangled title, is, and I don't know if you can be mandatory or not, but um, how are you working with them to make sure that they now have a will themselves so that this property does not uh, fall back into another tangled title um, situation? That is uh, one of our final uh, uh, efforts with them is to establish, one, we, we want to make sure that they're uh, in compliance at that point when we put the deed in their name, meaning we arrange uh, for the inheritance tax to be, uh, you know, uh, addressed. And then we talk about uh, a will uh, and, uh, you know, uh, any kind of succession kind of plan that, uh, you know, might be relevant to that particular individual. Right. In certain cases, that will also include making um, their heir a joint owner so that it can pass more easily without having to do another probate in, yeah. in six to seven years. Um, Allegheny County also has several free wills clinics through the pro bono partnership, so we have that availability to help them um, with wills referrals to make sure that that is drafted. Actually, some of that comes up during the negotiating uh, phase, okay, because there could be, again, uh, competing people, uh, heirs, and, and sometimes establishing a deed that has a current owner and then a succeeding owner actually helps to uh, facilitate the, the matter. Does that also include you going to court when it gets, I could say, funky, when you have to go to court to, when you have multiple Well, there, there, it could be in a court uh, situation, but uh, I'm relatively new. I'm told that a lot of this is established prior to actually uh, making a petition in the court. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's part of the process, you know, uh, for, uh, that's uh, relevant to the notification process. People sometimes can't, families sometimes can't come to terms with how they want to handle it. But, it. but again, every step in that process gets a little bit closer to clarifying the matter 
even if it's that we can't really identify one person on the deed. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if that helps or addresses your question. To give a relevant example, in one of those messier cases, we had an heir that didn't want to relinquish his, his claim well, to the property. That's, that's common. Right. We ended up getting 75% for our client and left his 25% in his name. So we are able to work with that and be um, creative where, where issues come about. For the most part, we've, most cases, we are able to get sole ownership for our client. When we are not, we certainly um, work with them and make sure that the title reflects their ownership as much as we are able to get for them. And again, the home is now preserved, at least for the family, to deal with amongst <clears throat> themselves, rather than, you know, some outside agency coming in. Yes. Well, do you think you might be able to help with this money? Because I'm assuming you're paying attorney fees and other fees, right? It's not just all for the twelve hundred. Well, actually, uh, I'm not quite sure how the how the accounting is done. But uh, uh, we don't charge the client's attorney's fees. We're on staff. Right, but this okay. Friday. Yes. I'm sorry? The sorry. fund would cover the attorney time. Is that, I didn't this realize that. This would be that. for okay. attorney time and fees. Okay. Yeah. So we don't know how many people. We are estimating right now um, roughly 35 clients will be assisted through this fund, and that also covers foreclosure prevention as well. I yeah. have a question. Yeah. I think your application said 45. 45, yes, sorry, 35 I think are, is, is our estimate for the total um, for mortgage foreclosure and tangled title combined, <coughs> and we're estimating an additional 10 for specifically tangled title under the lower income limit. Derek had a question. Derek, go ahead. Okay, yes, yeah, so um, regarding the tangled title, so if there is a uh, family member that, uh, you know, is now deceased and they, there's that since the only one ear left, uh, you know, that is to claim the property, oftentimes there is uh, an estate tax that is assessed in order for that title to be cleared and that, for that property to be transferred to that ear. Uh, are these funds to be used, you know, one, to help them through the legal process, but also to pay estate tax if, if that's, uh, you know, a, a part of that situation? Getting an answer. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I had to confer with my colleague. Uh, you're, you're correct that there is such a uh, an estate tax, but a lot of our clients are, are not subject to it, you know, because of uh, their income, I, I imagine. And their relationship with the decedent. Okay, yeah. We do not pay that out of the fund, though, in the cases where that would come up. Um, inheritance tax and estate taxes are the only cost currently that we ask our clients to cover. Um, estate tax typically does not come up in our cases because we don't necessarily go through the probate process. We go through orphans court through a um, petition known as a 3546 petition. It's under Title 20 um, of the Pennsylvania Code Statute 3546, and that bypasses the estate tax. Whenever you're looking at transfer tax for recording the property, lineal heirs don't pay the transfer tax. So most of our clients will not be subject to that unless their relationship dictates, uh, dictates pardon me, otherwise. Um, but as I said before, if something like that were to come up, inheritance tax and estate tax are not covered by the program. We help our clients to reduce it as much as possible based on various deductions, for instance, funeral expenses, back taxes, um, things like that. We can assert a payment plan for them, but it's the only cost currently that our clients face on their own. And that's so uh, I couldn't hear everything uh, you said, but it sounds like you said uh, if if uh, that situation arises, uh, you can pay closing costs, but not the estate tax. And if that, if I heard you correctly, does that just mean you can't help those clients? Because that, you know, in my experience, that's most of the situations when we're discussing tangled title issues. Of course, there's a lot of others, but the situations that I've encountered oftentimes include that situation. 
because of the method that we use going through orphans court it just it, the estate tax is not applicable so the estate tax specifically applies whenever you are dealing with probate on the register of will side um, most of our cases we don't go that route we use like i said the petition through orphans court um, which bypasses the estate tax altogether. It just isn't subject to it. So the only taxes that our clients to date have had to pay out of pocket have been the inheritance tax. The highest inheritance tax that we have seen was, I believe, $800, and we asserted a 14-month payment plan that they're able to pay monthly based on their income limits. So for future cases, if we are doing the probate and estate tax were to come up, um, based on our current model, we would not pay it. We would, like I said, try to use deductions and assert a payment plan. Um, but based on the methods that we've used so far, it hasn't been an issue in any of our cases. And to date, I believe we have helped 14 different households without it being an issue. Right. Oh, Jessica, quick question. Can these funds be used for that? I know the, the uh, program we do at our organization, because of the funds, our tax credit funds, we cannot use those funds to pay inheritance taxes and those other types of taxes. So would the, the funds that they would get, could they actually pay inheritance taxes with those funds? I don't know. I, I, Kyle, do you have a sense of the legislation <coughs> and what it says? Yeah, offhand, I, I don't know. I mean, that's something that we can pose to the URA legal counsel to get clarification on. I, I think the issue is because it's taxes. Yeah, my presumption it's, it's would be Jerome, it'll function the same, but I'm not a lawyer. Uh, right. They're lawyers, but. Right, right, oh. right, right, right. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, I just would like to know. Yeah. It's never actually been a matter that discouraged anyone from uh, going through the process, okay? Because when you get to that point, uh, you've succeeded in getting your name on the deed, okay? And uh, that gives you, uh, and, and again, as Gabrielle mentioned, the, the inheritance tax itself is often um, um, brought down because of uh, certain debts on the house, you know, like unpaid property taxes or school taxes, excuse me, something like that. They're considered like a, a deduction on that amount. And then there's often a payment plan on top of that. So it doesn't seem to be the bar. Is that your experience? Absolutely, and we make an effort to make sure that whatever we are doing for our client, we are doing it to put them in a better situation than where we found them. So right. we are very conscientious about counseling clients at the onset of the case to make sure they are aware that this could be the amount of inheritance tax you would pay. Currently, there are these back taxes that you will be responsible for. You will be responsible for homeowner's insurance, things like that, to make sure they really understand the financial burden of homeownership, and we go into it and that's why we do the title search from the onset to mm -hmm. understand any liens, any costs associated, really making sure and analyzing their income and their limitations that they will be able to financially support themselves if we put this house in their name. Our goal is never to get a house in somebody's name and have it be a crushing burden on top of their shoulders. We want them to be right. safer and happier and more secure than whenever they came in our door. Yes, it's because uh, it hasn't been said, I don't think, directly. When you get the deed in your name, you also assume all of the responsibilities that come with that property. And so as part of our uh, full service, neighbor legal services, we have social workers on, on site and we, on staff actually, and so we uh, actually put them in touch sometimes with our clients uh, as far as uh, getting services, related services that will help them with this overall project. Will you let them know about the new opportunities? From the Opportunity Fund? Absolutely. Oh, I'm, I'm so certain sure of it. I think Absolutely. That's the we'll give you a plug. I think that's the first thing we bring up. On the <laughs> uh, I have a, regarding uh, the sort of prevention uh, of tangled title with folks that we're working with, and uh, we might be recording deferred uh, mortgages or, you know, we're giving grants or the different things that we are doing, um, are we encouraging folks to make sure that there's a will, that there's a legal document that's saying, you know, how, how, what heirs get the property so we don't work on properties and then have this problem five or ten years down the road. Um, are right, we right now, a will is not a requirement of participating in the program. I mean, that's something I think the advisory board can talk about in, in more detail at <clears> some point. And then you had said something that the bar is doing some sort of pro bono work in clinics, and how does that work? 
Barbara Kern may be the best person to speak on that, but the Pittsburgh Pro Bono Partnership does have several wills clinics throughout Allegheny County. Any specifics I would address to Barbara, she works closely with the partnership. Partnership is an organization of large, large law firms and corporate legal departments and Neighborhood Legal Services sits on the administrative board. So the projects that they develop are ones which we have determined there is a need for to share our work or because it's work we can't do. So the partnership has now developed a wills clinic. It's actually for wills, power of attorney, health directives. They currently have seven sites throughout the city uh, administered by different, uh, one is by BNY Mellon, one is by FedEx, so on and so forth. One is by the Department of Environmental Protection. And so if we have someone in this project who needs a will, and that's our concern also. We don't want this tangled title mess going on generation after generation. So we then encourage them and give them the list of the wills projects. Those wills are prepared at no cost to the individual. Okay. The name of the partnership? I'm sorry? What's the name of the partnership? Pittsburgh Pro Bono Partnership. Maybe that's something that, that uh, <coughs> staff could reach out in the, in the next, before the next meeting to maybe figure out a way to at least be sure when we're doing promotional things and, and we've got service providers <coughs> that they're aware mm -hmm. that this exists and can refer folks and ask that question you, you can't, you know, I, I wouldn't say you make it a condition right now on participating, but certainly let people know that there's a resource available to them if they don't have a will. Yes, I mean, we can reach out and um, we can, if, it, if it's something, you know, where, where they can handle the, the influx of, you know, new folks, we can put a brochure together that goes in the closing packet, uh, alerting Great. people. Okay. Any other questions? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, Joanne, a motion, Valerie second. Anyone need to abstain? I need to abstain because okay. action housing applied in this category. Okay. Lena abstained. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, Jessica. Yes. I actually have to jump off, but I wanted to I guess go on record for making a nomination for the chair going forward before I leave, that's okay? Okay, that's fine. Uh, um, we also, before we get to nominations later though, we, we wanna talk about the roles of the chair first and make sure there's some clarification and suggest that if there's not, we might take a month to have a committee talk about roles of the chair and, and also roles of the advisory board in general, rules and rules and rules, because um, I think there have been some things come up. Now we've been operating for six months or so, and I think there have been some some things come up that we might need to talk about as well. But um, you can go ahead and do it, though, Derek. I, I just don't know if we'll get to that point or not. Kyle has. Well, to, I'm, to, I'm to that point, I, I think the idea yeah. of, of taking a month to you know have yes. at least a subgroup of us or a working group, you know. Yeah talk about some of that stuff makes a lot of sense um, okay yeah I mean do we want to just take that that okay. item now yeah let's move this item up now and okay. yeah okay okay so. okay and uh, I'll just time again I gotta run um, so I, I understand that there'll be more discussion about this and maybe more things added to the role but based on you know what I do know um, I would like to recommend uh, Joanne and Deming to be the new chair going forward. Um, think she would be great, um, represents the community, and you know has been a, a great part of this committee thus far. So I strongly would recommend her for this role. Um, and with that being said, I'm gonna have to uh, sign out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. You're welcome, bye-bye. Okay, so while we're on Jay uh, Rolls, um, yeah, so, so there was a motion made last month to um, have a chair, um, and that was also, uh, it was also listed in the HRNA report um, to the advisory board that that was their suggestion. 
uh, was to have the, a chair um, from the advisory board itself to work with staff um, and, and to, to work with all of us and to talk to me prior to two meetings and make sure you know everyone's sort of in agreement with the agenda items and so forth. So I, I think it's a really great idea. Um, but as um, several folks have came to me with questions over the last couple weeks though, it, it did sort of become clear as, you know, in addition to just sitting in this chair during the meetings, what else you know, should the chair be doing, um, which we didn't Listen have to. answers for? Yes. I just want to, I, I think taking a month is a great idea because, as you know, I have a lot of concerns. I don't think there's any, anybody really, um, maybe you, really in, truly independent on this board. I mean, everyone here works for an organization or a nonprofit. Everyone here either works for the city or is an elected official. And so if you're talking about the community controlling this, that's not happening because it's somebody with an interest still. So I think maybe we even need to look at the makeup of the board before we decide who's going to be chair. So um, I, I, I'd love to take a month to, to really work on this. But with that also, um, they're staggered terms. Yeah. So you have that yeah. in April, I think. There are four people expiring in April, on April 30th. and The um, term's expiring, not them, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. yeah hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Good point. The terms are expiring. Was bleak. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And um, so, so we'll be working with the administration over the next month. To, to figure out how that is handled uh, for those four people um, that have terms. Everybody has the, the list, I think, and, and knows the expirations um, of that. There's, there's also a person right now that, that is on leave um, from their position and um, so has not been an active um, member as well. Um, so so we, are, we will be talking to the administration uh, about those things and hopefully by the next meeting we'll have some direction as to that um, for, for those four folks that are expiring I'm operating under the assumption that that you would like to stay on the board if that is given an option but please have those conversations with me so I can um, communicate them to um, the administration um, so so that's that but but also just in general since we've been operating now for a while um, this is a great turnout today. We didn't have any problem getting a quorum, and I really appreciate that. There have been some months where we've had some difficulty getting a quorum. Um, so a couple of folks have mentioned to me, should we put some rules in place as to, you know, if you miss two or three meetings in a row, you know, you should step down if your schedule is, you know, not allowing you to participate fully, um, things like that. Um, and, and some other people have asked, you know, for some more clarification on the conflict of interest policy as well, um, and what that means for, for projects that someone either is directly or maybe more indirectly involved in. Um, so those are things we wanted to look at um, in the future and really hopefully come with some some small document of you know how some of these things can be addressed. I mean, what what are people's thoughts on that? Sounds like a governance committee. Yeah, or something. yeah. Like said, this is a governance committee <laughs> kind of. Yeah. yeah. All right. Who wants to be on the governance committee? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll do uh, it. Sure. So, uh, I absolutely. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. It. So we got Diamante, Adrian, well, on there. Okay. Mark. Did I miss anyone? Diamante, Adrian, Mark. I would just say I don't need to be on the committee, but I'm going to look forward and make sure I make a big deal about it being somebody truly independent. Otherwise, I think it should be somebody who we can hold accountable who does work for the government. So it's one or the other. It's a truly independent or somebody we can hold accountable. Please so do. I'll make sure that when that comes up. Okay. So we'll go with that group, but if anybody else or those of you on the phone, if anyone would like to participate in that, please let me know. So. Am I hearing that that's the direction people want to go is to take a month, have this group convene, talk about these things, um, maybe bring them back to the advisory board for acceptance of those roles prior to any vote on a chair? Okay, can someone make a motion saying that? So moved. <laughs> 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 I can't, I can't. 
motion. Unfortunately, I'm not on the What's your motion? Oh, my motion is to accept the to accept the proposal to form a governance committee um, to outline the roles and responsibilities of a chair. Second. Second. <laughs> okay, so we have Diamante and Sonia. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, going back. Um, let's see. Where were we? F. 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 Staff presentation regarding the Housing Opportunity Fund 2019 annual allocation meetings. So Bettina and Jamie um, are going to present on this. You want to sit here or you want to sit there? Sure, you can do that. All right, so as per the Housing Opportunity Fund legislation, HOF must provide an opportunity for public feedback and comment um, prior to the approval of the um, annual allocation plan. So HOF hosted a series of five community meetings throughout the city. And so this slide provides some examples of how HOF has been marketing um, the meetings and the programs. Um, some of the various channels include social media. Uh, the URA now has a Facebook page. Um, we've been promoting it through the mayor's uh, Facebook page as well. Um, we've done our ads and articles through the newspaper, uh, TV and radio, um, as well as attending community meetings, doing on the ground canvassing as well, and um, through next door, uh, city council, and also just promoting it throughout um, the mayor's office. Um, so as you see, we do have a variety of ways that we are reaching out to the community, um, and we will continue to promote HOF um, and the programs using these um, channels uh, moving forward. However, the best way to ensure that our programs are reaching those who really need it um, is to share HOF information within your own networks. Um, many of the articles and ads that are referenced up here and uh, promote HOF was a result of individuals sharing the information and then those individuals passing on the information to others. Um, so some of um, these articles, for example, the um, first one on the top left is an ad that we created at the URA to be in the Northside Chronicle, um, but some of the other organizations like Pump and Grounded um, just heard about the meetings through other sources and posted it through their own networks as well. Um, so this is just a really great way um, to promote and it's free, it's effective, um, and this is really just the best way to ensure that we're reaching the population that needs our programs the most. Um, I've received countless inquiries from individuals who heard about our program through friends and family members, other community groups, or coworkers. Um, and so I truly believe that each of us have access to different groups within Pittsburgh, but not one single person has access to all. So I really want to emphasize the need to share the information um, with those in your community, you never know um, if someone can benefit from it or not, or if that someone knows someone else who can benefit from our programs. Um, so just really pushing out the word. Um, I'm more than happy to provide that marketing material for you. I can give you my business card, um, any flyers, or even if you simply just direct them to the URA website, we are on there as well. All the applications and program information is on there, um, or just simply saying, you know, look up Bettina and she can help you out with the programs. Um, and so currently, right now, our down payment and closing cost assistance program is the only public facing program that is accepting applications right now, but in the coming weeks, we will be opening up the homeowner assistance program and the housing stabilization program. Um, and so we really want to make sure those who need our programs are receiving the information. Um, so we really need to start sharing that. Um, again, we will be using these channels, but it is really beneficial for everyone to just share the information. Just real quick to elaborate on those those timelines. So down payment, closing cost assistance, we are taking applications mm -hmm. now. Sharon is over there. Sharon, how many applications do you have right now? Okay, I have a total of six. One closed two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Two weeks
Great. And, and then on the homeowner assistance program, thanks, Sharon. On the homeowner assistance program, um, we, uh, now that we have approval to enter in contracts with the providers that you gave us last month, our legal staff is working on getting those contracts in place. We had a follow-up meeting with them. So we should have contracts in place with them in the next two weeks and an application. Uh, our legal department's also reviewing an application right now. The application for consumers will go out immediately after that. So I'm very hopeful that that application will be out to the general public by the end of March um, prior to the next meeting. That's a good question. Yes. Um, just to confirm, that's a two-step process they even if they were already working with a provider they need to fill out the URA yes. application yes that is correct so I uh, just a few comments I uh, the <coughs> community meetings I really felt like and I only attended one, the one in the West End so I want to thank you for having those I know and for those who did attend mm -hmm. but I was a little disappointed in just the format of it because I really didn't feel like we heard from the community and um, whenever you have something where you have to press a button I, I I did this once with another organization. I said, it's it's almost as if you to ask them, do you want your left arm cut off, your right arm cut off, your baby toe, so everybody picks their baby toe. You're not really getting a real opinion. You're getting something you've led them to. And so for me, I like to actually hear from people when, when we have meetings, not give them, you know, mm -hmm not help lead them to the answers we want to receive so for me I want real open dialogue that's one and but I do know the work that went into those and I appreciate all the work that went into them um, Two, I I think that one of the things we have to do with the um, the home repairs is somehow I think we need to work with the magistrate's office there's a lot of people that go to housing court time and time again who just don't have the money to repair homes and I think somehow there has to be um, some correlation that we're connecting with those people who I actually got kicked out of magistrate court once because I wanted to pay the <laughs> fine for somebody because they you know they couldn't pay the fine yeah. and um, they would hold me in contempt of court because I wouldn't put my purse down <laughs> but anyway <laughs> so, a true story anyway um, but I see, you know, mm -hmm. firsthand how, how horrible and how devastating that is for people who truly can't afford it. And I don't know how, if we even have the staff or if there's an organization that will work yeah. through that. So, um, so I actually do have an answer for that. Um, cause there are a couple judges in the court system right now looking at this and, um, um, I'm on a committee of like 20 people that, that convened with, uh, judge Christine Ward on this issue. And then I'm also speaking in two weeks with judge Mick, um, somebody help me. Pappas, thank you uh, for an outreach event he's doing. Um, but we are working with the court system. I'm, lear I'm learning about the court system right now. So what I would do is go to the head of the magistrates and, and okay. you know, like Ricky King or somebody. I wouldn't just okay. go to somebody who just got elected because they don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of the system. Um, so I would go to Ricky King first and talk to him. Okay, thank you. He's sort of like the, I don't know if, what you call him, but kind of like their spokesperson uh, yeah i don't know if he's self-appointed <laughs> leader or if he's if he really is if he was elected somehow i don't know i just know that he's been involved in this process for a long time and and also real quick to your to your other comment because i think we all agreed with you mm -hmm. about um you know needing to have more of that one-on-one -on -one, um right. interaction with advisory board members and, and with staff and uh the west end meeting was our first meeting we we started yeah. to tweak the process as we moved right. through each meeting and i think by the time we got to meetings number four and number five we had kind of a better mix of, mm -hmm. of all that we we did use the survey still and we're going to talk about the survey here in, in a, a second but we were able to have allocate a lot more time for advisory board members to talk i'm just going to say i'm like kind of like a little bit of a rebel even as though i'm an old lady but so i don't like anything that's controlled i like hearing people talk i mean i don't like okay. seeing the breakout sessions i don't like seeing i like seeing a real dialogue between the people and, and everyone to hear what the concerns may be and to to work through things that that's just me so <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> I'm never going to like anything that's controlled. So. <laughs> right. No, we understand that concern. Um, and like Jessica said, after every um, public meeting that we hosted, we the staff did a debrief meeting to discuss, you know, ways that we can constantly improve these meetings. Um, we took into account the advisory board members who attended the meetings and their feedback as well. And we did realize that obviously the most important session and the most important part of our meeting was the one-on-one -on -one conversations that residents had with advisory board members um, so many of them stayed longer just to speak with advisory board members so we shifted the schedule and the timing of the meeting to really focus on that towards the end um, and so moving forward that is definitely something that we will consider um, when we structure these public meetings and again you know 
I know your preference is to have these open style um, communications so everyone can hear the concerns. A ruckus. I like a ruckus. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we can, of course, um, look into ways that we can incorporate more public comment while also getting the data that we need from the survey. Um, towards the end, towards our last meeting, it ended up the survey being a very small portion of the meeting, and then the rest of the time was through one of our interactive um, activities or just spending time with the advisory board members. And so I just like on a good note, I was happy to hear people in my district taking advantage of the program. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I have a general comment that I think we need to feed people at six o'clock. Yeah. I mean you can't well, really think or you don't want to stick around if you hadn't had dinner. So I know we have budget. We have here. to look that well, into the budget. You know what? But. I would love for that to be something that the governance committee that we talked okay. about <laughs> talks about. <laughs> um, because I understand the need for it, but um, um, we're also very fiscally responsible <laughs> as well. So I think if the advisory board could help us come up with some guidelines as to what is appropriate mm -hmm. for, for food and those types of expenditures out of the fund, I, I would appreciate that. I don't mind feeding people either as long as it's the public, not all of us. Just sitting right. around the table, just saying. Yes, that's a good point. If you're asking folks to come out at 6 o'clock at night, my experience yeah. in doing community organizing is you better feed them or they're and not going to hang around. Care. Well, and just sort of that point, I think one of the things that would be great if we could do is that there are community activities going on all year in all of these neighborhoods. You know, spaghetti dinners and community days, and it feels like it would make a lot more sense and be more impactful to actually build relationships and do outreach and have time for dialogue in places where people are coming and support those events and mm -hmm. hear it organically and be in neighborhoods when that's happening um, and you know I, and buy I think that we should support them <laughs> well exactly because then we can also go we can support that neighborhood if there are fees involved we can bring those into the neighborhood and support what they're doing it just seems like there's so many great things that are happening and instead of creating a parallel process how can we organically respectfully go into the process that already happens mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think we all agree with that. I think fatina has been doing that, um, mm -hmm. getting out into community meetings, and we'll continue to do that throughout the year. But but the legislation <laughs> stated that we had to have these uh, 2019 allocation meetings, but we, we agree. And maybe that's something for governance to also talk about a little bit as to how would advisory board members in their own neighborhoods mm -hmm. be able to take a more structured conversation to places and just elevate yes. this. Right. Just to echo my previous comment to you, again, the most popular part of our meetings was when they were able to talk with advisory board members. Mm -hmm. So I think providing extra opportunity for residents to speak directly with advisory board members outside of our five yes. publicly hosted meetings would be really great to consider as well. Yes. And, and I, I want to thank meeting, all of so okay. you. Tell me when you want me to be someplace. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank all of you. Most of you yes. that are sitting here attended at least one of those meetings and Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. A couple of you attended, you know, two or three of them, and, and we really appreciate that. Thank you to you and, and the staff. All right, we can move forward now. So um, every HOF staff member participates in some form of community outreach. These are just some examples of the groups that we've met with or will meet with in the coming weeks. Um, again, if you know of any community groups that uh, will benefit from HOF programs, um, please let me know and I can reach out to them to schedule some kind of meeting either to be put on their agenda to talk about a program, whether it's a five minute blurb about HOF or if they want me to do a full blown presentation. Um, I am available and willing to come out to whatever community groups need HOF programs and need the information. Um, and again, like I said, our homeowner assistance program and housing stabilization programs will be up and running soon. Um, and this is a, a great resource for residents. We want to make sure we're getting the word out there. Um, and I understand that the application process for these programs can be very daunting and overwhelming. And I'm more than happy to meet one on one with residents or, you know, meeting with leaders in the community to, to teach them how best to tackle the application. Um, but I'm very accessible and I'm more than happy to walk people through the application process. Um, it is, you know, overwhelming and that might deter some people, but I don't want that to be the reason why someone does not apply for our programs. Are you working with Community Affairs Office? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in constant uh, communication. 
And you can see, actually, can oh, you go back, yeah. Bettina, real fast? You can see the non-community-based meetings as well. We are starting to meet with groups like the Federation of Teachers. Mm -hmm. We have a couple other union meetings you know coming up so getting the word out through those mechanisms and I, as I well. want to point out that there's a big gap on my side of town but we are forming a housing committee that's gonna that uh, actually the hilltop um cdc and mwcdc are working to help us build this you know okay. capacity of a few folks okay great it's actually have a group so and we'll have a group it'll be the southwest group and uh, and also i'll mention too that um bettina and i meet with council on a pretty regular basis we'll we'll meet with you know every week maybe two two different council people and keep rotating through and so whenever you know they have meetings and so forth that they want us to attend they they talk to us as well okay um and so this just provides um, a summary of the attendees who came to each of the meetings um so we, total number of attendees is approximately 115 across all five of the meetings and then um survey responses to date i actually checked it this morning and we're up to 100 we're gonna hold we're gonna open the um survey um opened until march 15th uh, just so that we can get um, as many responses as possible Vatina, for clarification, that's the online survey, mm -hmm. not the survey they filled out in the meeting. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, so that the um, survey responses that says 93 is the online survey. Um, and again, I encourage you to um, post the link or share the link to people um, in your own networks as well so that we can capture a, a wide range of individuals. Is there a, a goal with these numbers that you'd like to see? 250. 250 so right now, for attendees? This year, I think we have 203. 250 would provide a confidence interval that, I'm sorry. 250 would um, be a good sample. Um, <laughs> and more that, the more that there are, the more confident we can be in the results. And I'll talk a little bit about mm -hmm. um, tapping into some uh, populations that are underrepresented so far. Yeah, and, and yeah, just real quick, because Jamie will talk about that. Mm -hmm. These meetings, the total number is relatively similar to who attend total number that attended um, the 2018 allocation meetings, but the, the demographics um, are a little bit different, and we're going to talk about that. I just want to say I think that it would be really helpful to have workshops for people to fill out the forms. Yes. Because I think these meetings are one thing, but when they, people leave, they're more confused than when they came in sometimes. So I think actually having a workshop like here. We're going to help you fill out the forms. Yeah, okay. I can definitely host a series of them um, as the applications coming out, or even a little a prior, bef like before the applications come out, so people know what to expect. But that's definitely something um, that we can look into doing. Um, and so I'm just going to provide a brief format of the meeting, um, and then I'm going to pass it over to Jamie, who's going to discuss the data collected and the reasoning behind the questions and the information that we were collecting, the reason why we collected them in the first place. Um, so the format of the meeting, um, the goal was to provide an update on the 2018 annual allocation plan and to hear feedback on how our current programs are structured. Um, given that our programs are just rolling out, we understand that we will not be able to collect as much feedback feedback um, in regards to those who are able to take advantage of our programs. So we were really trying to focus on getting feedback on how, you know, whether or not our current programs are aligned with the needs of the community um, and, you know, how they're structured and if there was any comment regarding that. Um, but most importantly, we did want to gather feedback for the future 2019 annual allocation plan. We wanted to hear ideas, concerns, and comments um, regarding our current programs, which programs they'd like to see funded, if they're different or if they're the same, um, and then just general concerns and comments and feedback on HOF. Um, so prior to the meeting, everyone received a resource sheet that provided a definition of commonly used terms like AMI or permanent affordability or affordable housing, um, just because a lot of individuals may not know what those terms mean when they see it up on the slide. Um, they were also provided with the AMI chart with the 30, 15, and 80% AMI levels. Um, and so we uh, jumped into a, a brief presentation of HOF history, a summary of the HOF legislation, and then also a summary of the feedback received last year through Pittsburgh United's meetings. Um, and then we went into an interactive survey. That's when we used the clickers um, towards the end of the, our meeting series. That portion tended, tended to be a lot 
lighter than it was pretty survey heavy in the beginning and um, we refined the process to really focus on just the the questions and the, the questions that we wanted to address um, so then everyone participated in um, the survey through the clickers um, and then Jamie can again elaborate more on the data collected um, individuals also participated in a map and annual allocation plan activity um, Attendees were able to create their own HOF annual allocation plan um, as well. So I think that um, was able to shed a lot of light on, you know, we have limited resources and you can only pick certain areas to fund. And I think that made people realize, you know, really um, what is important, what needs to be funded um, for their community. And then we also, again, had the Ask the Advisory Board activity, uh, which was the most popular portion. Um, and you know, residents really loved having the opportunity to sit down with the advisory board members and talk about ho affordable housing concerns within their community and um, concerns that affect them directly. Um, so again, uh, I'll echo what Jessica said. On behalf of HOF, we'd like to thank all of the advisory board members, uh, volunteers, and community organizations that volunteered at the meetings and helped uh, facilitate the meetings. We are extremely grateful um, for you taking the time out of your days to help us. Uh, so now I'll pass it over to Jamie, uh, who will provide an explanation of the data we collected. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're going to talk about data, but I will try to make it um, fun so that you can stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we've talked a little bit about this survey. I just want to back up um, to sort of the planning that went into this and then how we're going to be using this information and sort of the next steps that you can expect from us. Um, the first goal of the survey was simply to gauge public opinion on <clears throat> the issues that were taken on in the 2018 allocation plan. Um, the way that we did that was just to ask the participants to rate those issues on a scale from one to five, um, and you will receive a full sort of summary, um, pretty simple analysis of, of the responses that we received once we receive all of them. Um, the second one, and I think extremely importantly, we want to ensure representation on those opinions across key populations. Um, one of the things that we've done so far is make sure that people that could not attend the meeting um, are still able to reply to the survey. We've had discussions with the advisory board on some of the difficulties around hosting the survey online. Um, the, the good side of that is the, the online survey doubled um, the responses that we have available to us and also um, addressed some of the attendance issues that we saw, which were that in the live meetings, they were overwhelmingly homeowners. Uh, white um, attendees were overrepresented, and um, we got very few responses from people who had self-identified as having had an affordability issue in the past. <clears throat> so those are balancing out a little bit better on the online section. Um, another step that we're taking to uh, adjust that is to work with partners to target more vulnerable residents um, using some surveys on paper. We have to do that in a way that balances against uh, actually entering that data and processing it before you have to put your allocation plan together. So one of the things that um, we'll be doing is attending a meeting that the Housing Authority um, already has on the books for some of their tenants um, uh, and doing those paper responses and they're helping us adjust some of the language so that um, we're getting the same information but just in a little bit of a different way. Um, the last goal of the survey was just to kind of cross-section how are different residents seeing uh, different things. So we'll be sort of slicing the data based on demographics, based on whether they're owners or renters, and then very importantly, whether or not they have had affordability challenges. And for those of you that haven't seen the survey or, or been uh, present, which uh, not many of you, but um, for those that haven't, uh, those, that question, um, the way that we have it phrased is, have you ever experienced any of the following? Uh, eviction, foreclosure, um, landlord selling the property, landlord increasing the rent, there's a couple others, and then there's just a, you know, another uh, situation. How do I? Oh, there we go. Okay. 
So the next thing that we did was um, to have this map activity. And the first goal of that was to identify geographic wants and needs of the community. Um, the way that we did that was to have them place stickers on um, key locations where they spend time. So those were um, home, work, school, and, um, and uh, another place that you spend a lot of time, which we let them sort of self-identify. Um, the, the conversation that we had after that was just to say, you know, what is the connection between these places that you spend a lot of time and affordable housing? Um, and of course, one of the answers is you need to be able to access those things. I learned a lot about um, the needs of uh, parents and other guardians with school children. Um, the second goal was to understand some of the geographic facets of, of the affordable housing needs. Um, so so the, the last two questions that we asked were, one, where do you see a need for affordable housing? And two, where would you like to live if you could pick anywhere? I'm happy to say that a lot of people just said, I wanna live where I live now. Um, the next step with that is gonna be to, um, to document all of those uh, thoughts in the map, um, as well as documenting some of those comments. And then the final goal, which was really important to us, is to, mock, to democratize some of the terms that we use. I think a lot of us, uh, myself included, are guilty of using sort of industry terms. Um, and uh, you know, we're talking about fair housing, we're talking about areas of opportunity. We want people to be able to understand and participate in that discussion. So when we're asking these questions, the goal is really to engage residents in a conversation about the places that they live and about the places that they spend time. Um, so we're gonna continue to have that conversation and I think there are a lot of other topics that we can work together um, to make sure that we're sort of having an authentic conversation around. The, the next step for this is really just to, to compile that and make that part of a report. Jamie, the, the map activity, that's, that was just through the meetings though? Or is there a... Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's something I would love to figure out how to do uh, in a different way eventually, but I'm not sure how to do it yet. Okay. The last activity um, before having those uh, sort of roundtable discussions um, was this annual allocation plan activity that Tina mentioned. Um, essentially what we did was give residents 10 stickers to represent $10 million. Um, we wrote, uh, we, we put this table together that looks a lot like your allocation plan, um, listing the five uh, programs as they are now and, and uh, an explanation of those and then listing um, a spectrum of affordability um, income levels from low income to extremely low income. Um, so the one goal is just to have that gut check. Um, what you're gonna receive to, toward that end is a comparison between um, your allocation plan from 2018 and um, the responses that we received in the meetings. The second goal was to expand on community generated program ideas. So Councilwoman, I really appreciate the very good point that you made about making sure that we're not um, leading people into certain responses. I think that there are ways that we can continue to work on that. Um, a first step towards that was to make sure that we did have these write-in options. So if they wanted to say allocate, you can see on this one, there's supportive services at the bottom and there's like a ton of stickers um, on that, uh, that block. So I will, um, we'll make sure that we have a good summary of that. Um, I thought that that was super interesting. And just real quick, this is probably going to be eerily like what we all do as an advisory board <laughs> in a couple of weeks. I mean, it was very similar to what we did last year where we all just, you know, allocated money into each different item. So, so we will be able to compile all those to, to give that to you um, prior to us doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, the last activity was, as you know, uh, having the residents sit down with you and sort of have, um, have a more open-ended conversation. Um, this one, we have had an opportunity to make some initial observations about at this point. One of them is that supportive services issue that, um, that somebody pointed out on the last slide. Um, the second one is um, having programs that, we had a lot of people who were at the meetings that said, I'm just above the income threshold, like how do, how do what happens for me, you know? Um, same thing with the online survey, we have an open-ended comment um, and, and we're getting similar things. 
Um, the third is that um, people are really concerned about gentrification. Um, they want us to be proactive about, about identifying places with rising proper, property values and um, coming up with some creative strategies to deal with that. Um, the next one was about uh, rehab over new construction. Um, I think that's something that we've talked about a lot and it's extremely important um, given the building stock in Pittsburgh um, and simply the cost associated with new construction. Um, the last one is, um, we've talked about this today, is increasing some of the funding for um, tangled title and estate planning. So with that, and, uh, and um, those were just some of, of the responses that were on the sheets. We weren't able to put them all on, but if those of you that, that were there, if there are others you would like to just sort of mention I mean, right now. I mean, like in the hill, in the north side, um, a lot of responses were around vacant blighted buildings on, yes. you know, 15, mm -hmm. uh, the hill district was 15 and one, and that was a consistent theme that I heard. Okay. Uh, and talking to folks one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. I think that's similar in our area, too, even though, you, you know, when you talk to people, that's a big concern, huge concern. What, what else, as advisory board members, did you hear in those sessions? Something that came up at the, the West End Table Talks was, and, and maybe it kind of falls under number three, but... Um, sort of like the, the, the neighborhood character, right? And the importance that the housing market kind of plays within that and then the complementary kind of commercial, et cetera, and so on. So mm -hmm. um, that was something that was discussed a lot through one of the three sessions that, that Derek and I did on the mm -hmm. table talks. I would say generally, at least for the two meetings that I attended, I think these are largely reflective of what we heard in addition to, to you know what Mark and the councilwoman added. I think in my district in general, there's just a distrust for government being involved in any type of housing or land or, or water or anything else just about anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's just, and they have reason to be. People went to jail for what they did in one of my communities. So, I mean, they have reason to be concerned. So I think that, um, that did general come up distrust. In one, of the, one of the sessions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. During, during that, those, any type of time you have discussions about housing and uh, property in, in our area, you're going to have. You, it's just going to raise a level of concern for our area. And I think there's just a lot of distrust that we have to, that's why I want us to do what we have to do and do it right. And I think um, part of why people um, came out to some of the meetings is because they are concerned that they're going to lose their homes. They, they are hearing about Pittsburgh and, um, mm -hmm. you know, the reason this campaign worked is because it was keep Pittsburgh home. Mm -hmm. um, so I think mm -hmm. that there's a lot to be said for that. But I, I also think that... Um, well, I, I'll talk about this down in another part of the agenda, but okay. about the community outreach, I, yes. I'll talk about it later. Okay. So one of the items that is not is not reflected here, and I don't know that it will ever be reflected in the way we've structured the conversations, is that folks who are at the lowest level of the income spectrum, the incredible competition and lack of resources. So for folks who are trying to use their Section 8 vouchers who are at the lowest end, folks mm -hmm. who are trying to get into public housing options at that lowest end, or mm -hmm. compete in the open market, I know we have targeted programs for the 30% AMI, but especially for folks who are, say, for example, trapped into their SSI income. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This group is so underrepresented in any community conversation that we have for a variety of reasons. And I'm curious as to whether or not it would make sense to really try to do a targeted outreach effort related to folks who are at that 30% and below. And I'm going to look back at Bob Damewood um, because I think that that things that we're doing don't touch those folks in the same kind of way. And I think that the kind of outreach efforts that we do don't get to them and don't get to um, the depth and breadth yes. of what their experience is. So, so. That's just something I'd like us to take a look at. Yes, and that is an extremely um, good mm -hmm. and important point. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is when the um, uh, the original housing needs assessment was conducted, that was in 2014, so that's pretty stale at this point. But um, one of the things that they found was that 25% of housing choice vouchers are returned because people can't find it. It is now 70%. <laughs> exactly. 70. Exactly. So almost three times in the past five years. Um, so yes, one of the things is gonna be next week having that, um, that sort of adjusted survey process at a housing authority meeting, but I think we absolutely do need to be um, spending that time to make sure that we're targeting that population. And a great place to actually do that outreach is 
the SROs, hmm. boarding house configurations. There are uh -huh. lots of hotels, the hotel on McKnight Road and other suburban hotels. Mm -hmm. Th that's where folks are going um, mm -hmm. to try to fit that housing gap. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I don't, I apologize, I have to leave. Um, and I hate to throw that large of a topic out. Uh, but, I, but I do think that that's a, a really important group to talk about. Yeah. And they're missing. And I think HOF yeah. gives us some opportunity to do some really creative things to assist mm -hmm. that group. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Absolutely. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, now on to a couple administrative <laughs> manners, but one overlaps a little bit with this conversation about who we're reaching in our meetings. Um, but before we get there, uh, just to order on the agenda, G, the annual audit, um, and H, the annual report. Um, both of these things, in accordance with the legislation, we need to start working on now. They, they need to be commissioned or started by March 31st and they need to be finished by June 30th um, for this year we do have some staff suggestions we wanted to talk about uh, keep in mind that this committee was formed I think you reported at the end of June and started in July and we spent several months with the allocation process so we actually spent did not spend very many funds um, in 2018 and the only funds that were spent was just um, we passed it out at last month's meeting some small amounts for administrative a um, little bit of URA staff salaries but we had we the, the primary expense in 2018 was HRNA advisors um, was the consultant that took us through the allocation plan process um, and there were a couple of little expenses due to Post Gazette for advertising um, and for a law firm to review the down payment closing cost assistance. And I think that was, and, and Pittsburgh United had a contract with, with um, the, the URA for Housing Opportunity Fund. Um, and those were the only expenses in 2018. So, so given that, um, what we are suggesting is there is a firm, Mar Duzel. I think I said that correctly, that does the URA's um, annual audit. They will be in the URA doing this over the next couple months um, and have given a, a fee quote of 2500 for them to add on this component and will be able to complete it over the next couple months um, prior to the June 30th deadline. So for this year, that would be the, the staff suggestion, but recognizing um, that for next year when we operate for a full year of programmatic expenses um, to be fair and equitable we will do an rfp or an rfq for um auditors at that point so and i, I wanted to throw that out i for realize discussion. that's a very small amount and it's mm -hmm. probably not even worth doing an rfp for it probably cost more than staff but i'm going to not vote because in favor of it um so because i just have an issue with my reducer getting all the contracts um handed to them pretty much in, in a lot of ways. So I'm going to vote okay. no on this. But I understand okay. the reason why you wouldn't want to do an RFP for that amount. OK. Any other comments on that? OK. <laughs> we need a motion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I make the motion that for the 2018 annual audit that the Housing Opportunity Fund um, combined with the URA for under my reducer. All those in favor? Oh, we need a second. I'm sorry. Jerome seconded. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No. Okay. One no. Any abstentions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. In a, in a, in a similar vein with the annual report, um, we, we are also instructed to do an annual report. And... Um, you know, it is a little weird for 2018 since there's no, you know, we don't, we didn't close any down payment closing costs or any, any loans or even any rental loans in 2018. It, 2018 was really more about a process than, than, uh, you know, closing loans and expending money. Um, for, for that uh, reason, you know, we suspect the annual report to be relatively small. And, and just detail a, a process that has happened. Um, and the suggestion on the table, and once again, this is just for 2018, we plan to do an RFQ or an RFP 
for 2019, but for 2018, the suggestion would be to um, work with the company that is doing the URA annual report in a very similar way as with the audit to, to amend that contract to include not really doing the report, but setting up a template for us where, where staff could then fill in the information with the help of advisory board and fill in the pictures into the template um, just just because you know the programs have not been operational is it um, kind of duplicative of the report that HR and ARD provided since they probably detailed the process I mean it's well what HR and a provided was not an annual report but we will use the HRA report to to fill in the annual report which is why uh, we, we would only want to pay for a template. We, we don't feel like we need to hire a firm to do the report for us when we have this information. So there's no in cost house. associated? Uh, we don't have the cost yet for it. Um, I'll have the cost uh, by the next meeting, and, and um, I can let people know actually within a week. Wall to wall is the... Um, the firm that that has done the URA report and we are meeting with them tomorrow we weren't able to get the meeting in before before today's meeting but I can email the advisory board once we have that amount can we not get an extension and do like a combined report would that be possible to do like a 2018-19 annual report I, mean, I didn't encompassing... write the legislation I don't know legislation asks for yeah tomorrow. I would just, we, we should defer for a month until you get an actual cost and understand what that's really going to be. Okay. I, I also think that, I mean, the annual report for 2018 doesn't have to be anything elaborate. No. So, so is there even a need to pay somebody for a template? Can, well, can you just put it together between the annual audit, because that's, the numbers are going to be part yeah. of it, and the stuff that HRNA did? I mean, we've talked about that. Um, there's some branding issues um but i i will say this in terms of the amount is there there's actually a contract that that we already have with wall to wall for um that was sort of an add-on contract to ura contracts to design the billboard and there is um some funding about three thousand dollars remaining in that contract and since this is just a template including the logos that are already in existence I am actually optimistic that it will be under that amount um, and we could just use the existing contract. So I'm wondering so that we could get started if like maybe we could have a motion that if that is the case and it fits within an existing contract that we can move forward. But if it exceeds that, that we would need to bring it back to the advisory board. I don't know how people feel about that. It's just a suggestion. I personally, I'm not going to vote for anything until I know an amount. So, okay. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but I'm not going to. I mean, I'm okay with bringing it back next month, too. It'll delay us one month getting started, but I think we should still have it finalized by June 30. But I don't think it's going to be, you know, very time consuming. I feel much more comfortable bringing it back. Yeah. Okay. All right. We will bring it back next month. So, we'll table that. I, um, this is to enter into two requests for qualifications for um, community outreach advocacy planning activities and for printing services. So the URA does have an RFP and RFQ requirements um, for procurement where procurement is an open equitable process um, for everything we do um, or so, so that is our suggestion there has been some um, you know people approach us wanting to help participate in community outreach um, and at the last advisory board meeting the advisory board actually um, had a motion that we work with um, Pittsburgh United for additional community outreach and at the time we stated that the URA does have a procurement process that would need to be followed. So what the suggestion on the table is today is that um, over the next two months, staff issues two RFQs, one for community outreach um, slash planning activities, um, and then another one for, for printing services. And 
uh, possibly add the, the marketing um, services onto that as well, printing, marketing, advertising services, um, and do them as RFQs, not RFPs, which what that means is it's not RFPing a particular project at the time, but it's just getting a slate. So anyone who would want to do these services for the Housing Opportunity Fund moving forward would respond to the RFQ. Um, the advisory board would then, you know, help. Uh, we would form a committee to review the responses and then create a slate that would go to the advisory board and also to the URA board so that in the future when you know, things happen because life happens relatively quickly. Sometimes we need to, you know, have outreach for a meeting or something like that. Then we could just go to the slate of firms because there have been, um, you know, several firms, some of them um, smaller firms, smaller consultants or MWBE firms, um, some larger firms as well that have expressed interest in doing this. So um, that is the proposal on the table. Ad additionally, um, to address the concern of um, the data from the meetings we just talked about, we were very heavy on homeowners versus renters, um, which in some respects worked out because some of our consumer facing programs that are up and running now, like down payment, closing cost assistance is, is geared toward homeowners, but, but we do not want to um, you know, move forward without making sure we we outreach to the tenants as well. So, the other suggestion that's um, that we have talked about is potentially holding an event in the the URA in the city's new building on the Boulevard of the Allies, um, which is downtown and on bus routes in a, a central location, um, probably near the end of April in celebration of Fair Housing Month where we open up the first floor, the bottom floor of the building for a networking event and also at that time potentially present the draft 2019 allocation plan, should be in draft form by that point, and present it for feedback prior to it going to the May advisory board and URA board um, in, in final form and um, potentially contract um, for a, a small contract underneath RFQ um, procurement guidelines, um, so probably less than $5,000, less than $10,000 uh, to be under guidelines um, with uh, Pittsburgh United or some of the consultants that they directly you know, work with um, to help us schedule this event. That is um, the suggestion on the table. How, how often would you open up this RFQ process? Like, what's the term of this slate that you originally... You know, for the URA, a lot of it is three years, but we could do it at whatever interval you would like to see us do it. It feels long, but one is too short, so... Yeah. yeah. Maybe <laughs> two, two, then. Two. I mean, do we two. can do it every two years. <laughs> do that's two. What the advisory do two. Like I, I'm see. good with two. Okay. I'm not good with three. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, the... RFQ for the printing services. Is there a reason we can't do those in-house? We don't have a print shop at the URA. But you couldn't use ours in the city? Or if ask you let for, us use it for Or free. ask for one of the universities <laughs> to do it for free or something. I mean, well, I, don't, I just feel like we're always ready to spend public dollars so quickly. Hmm. I, I mean, I, I don't I don't. I mean, I'm not going to stop it now, but I'm just going to say in the future, I think we should have some conversations about that with, okay. with folks. Okay. On the printing services, doing an RFQ wouldn't stop you from using the cities right. if you can work that For out free, in yeah. the interim. Right. And then if it doesn't work the out, the cities are the universities. I mean, they, they help us a lot with printing. So. That, I, I think. And they help us with legal services too, for free. So, I mean, when I hear some of this stuff, it's like. It's, I, th I think as it relates, maybe not this year's um, annual report, but you know, in future years, if it ends up being something that's sort of bound. Yeah. You know, it, it maybe something that's different than more than costly, just be, right? Yeah, just be done so, via, um, you know, a print shop at so the university. That's my or, comment on that, yeah. and on the advocacy outreach planning thing. I, when I hear that you're, I think it's actually good that we got a lot of homeowners responding because they usually don't respond to anything. You know, at least not in my area. Um, so I was happy to hear that we had some homeowners responding. And I mean, actually, I think that we should be putting an emphasis on them, but also making sure we're getting some some mixed input from. Renters, I think there has to be a balance, um, but I, 
I think that it, it just uh, you know, in absorbing everything that happened, I mean, this whole idea came about with Pittsburgh United, and not that I like the way they did it, and not that I think that everything was great, but I feel like they've been they were part of the process the whole time, and I feel like there's like some disconnect now, and I just wonder if there just needs to be some better. Um, relationship building with him in general. I mean, whether it's with this this RFP Q process or not, I think that in general, I mean, when I see the staff that's been hired, I mean, I see very few minorities on the on the staff, and and not that that's not if somebody's qualified that that shouldn't preclude them from having a job, but I think that we've got to remember that you know you're not going to reach some of the people that you want to reach and and they were effective in some of those some of the areas where you're trying to reach so i think that i think we need to do better in in trying to figure mend that that relationship because i think that there's some tension and, and whether there is not it is or whether it's my perceiving things that aren't even there because you know hey I'm, I'm paranoid i could be seeing stuff i'm not seeing i just feel like there needs to be some way that we sit down with the administration and them and try to figure out how we could move forward together because if it weren't for them we probably wouldn't even have this right now so i just think we should have that conversation i have a question about the idea of a slate of consultants on a rolling basis i feel like not that i think rfq is a good idea but i feel like it's it should be a strategic conversation about what outreach is needed and you know review applications for who can provide those services because I don't really understand just having a slate on hand. I think it's kind of what outreach would complement what staff's doing to like. For well, I think that's the benefit of having a slate because people have different different niches. For example, we have a slate of appraisers at the URA. Some are better with residential. Some are better with commercial. So we kind of can go to the different, you know, wherever their strengths. And yeah. You mentioned that there are some larger organizations or firms that have have expressed interest. Mm -hmm. I could see where that's more often not necessary, but could be at some point. Correct. Yeah. Regarding the printing is, can you consult with legal to see if in the procurement you can limit it to s small businesses and, and, uh, okay. and um, adopt a, a maximum as far as gross, you know, your. Okay. I I can consult with them. I, don't I wouldn't know the want answer a rolling thing. Yeah. We have large printing services, and I, for tax dollars, as, as Councilwoman has always said, I think yeah. if we're going to use ta if we use tax dollars for this in the whole vein of what HOF is all about, let's support our small businesses okay. only. I love that. Um, and, and a small um, with preference to veterans, minority women business. Just saying. So, so if, if the idea is to sort of have the slate on, on both of these instances for two years, but we're doing a rolling RFQ, I mean, do we need a sort of a close date then where the two-year clock starts? Because um, if it's rolling, it's open-ended, and if we're saying there's a two-year period, then we're implying that there's a start date yeah. for the two years. Um, I guess it's more a question for the for the group on what makes sense, but. But you have a practice in place with the URA. If yours is three years and it's not, then it's not rolling. So I, I'm just following some more practice. I mean, we could go to the URA board for for two years from the, the date of that board meeting, and I mean, I think that's the answer. Right? So what would the what deadline are we setting to to review them at the next committee meeting and going to the URA board, or is 60 days from now? You know, what kind of time? Yeah, I mean, we have to issue DRFQs first, and um, just another timeline thing. The staff right now is working on issuing the final RFP for the fifth program, which is the, the for sale um, program. So I don't want to <laughs> delay getting that out. So I'm, I'm not 100% certain of the timing of us issuing these RFPs. Um, but if we have them issued by the next advisory board meeting, then people would need to respond to them. Um, you know, so I don't know if, if we, there might not be enough time then to give people a month to respond to get it to the May advisory board. It might be to June, of, you know, it might be June before this gets put in place. I think, uh, will we see the RFK before it goes out? Um, I can circulate it. Yeah, I'd like to see how it's worded. Okay.
Anything we just else? Need a motion to yeah. move the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a motion to move um, the RFQs forward for the two proposed. Second. Areas. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone oppose or abstain? Okay. Do and we, then to, to basically comment that the motion actually should be a generalized very motion because we don't have any template in front of us. <laughs> We're not voting on anything specific, just the will of it's, the board to the pursue process. this to move. To, I think the motion is start. to to have staff issue these two right. RFQs. Right. And circulate the circulate and circulate them for review right. prior to issuing. That's right. the motion for right. That's the motion. Second and then now we're all in favor, right? <laughs> okay, so Joanna first, Teresa seconded, everyone's all in favor. Yes. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Did, did we need to do something for a shorter term to, to help with this uh, community that's, meeting? Is that that's a recommendation? To you, but yes, I mean if if that is something the advisory board would like to do, but it is only a suggestion. Um, you know, we also can probably, um, you know, we can also schedule something in house as well. But for outreach purposes, if that is something the advisory board would like to do, then you can make your own motion to do that. I, I just think that having attended, I think three of the meetings, that it, well, I was glad to see homeowners were, were turning out and had some great feedback there. Um, where I know from last year, we're missing uh, another point of vantage point in. Um, that would be good for us to hear before we're voting on how this money gets spent. So I, I would make that motion so that we get uh, get a broader uh, representative uh, feedback. So Mark made the motion. Does anyone second Mark's motion? So I, I can, so my concern is also now when you're talking about making sure we're reaching renters. What about people that aren't that are homeless? What about people that are in women's centers and shelters and Places like, I mean, how are we going to reach those people? Because, I mean, to me, that those are the people that are really in need of housing right now that we really should be trying mm -hmm. to figure out a way to reach. So I'm just, I don't know how you Right. Know. I mean, we do meet pretty regularly with um, different committees that Department of Human Services pulls together. I've, I've gone to a lot of these meetings recently. They all have different names. There's the Homeless Advisory Board. There's LHOT. I forget what that stands for. Um, local housing option team. Local housing option team. Um, so... I would say we've we've tried to start to get word out to these groups, but I will take any suggestions as to how to you know get word out better to those groups. I mean, I think Adrian's comments before yeah, she left they, spoke yeah. to that to mm -hmm. a degree, whether it's the SROs or some of yep. the uh, hotels you know in and around the city that, okay. that you know mm -hmm. the service providers are aware where folks are. I think that's a way we can start to do that. Yeah. I'm good. Maybe our new homeless assistance providers. There's that too. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion on the table and a clarification on that motion was the contract less than five thousand dollars. So is that what you had mentioned? Yes. Five to ten, you said. I I mean it's one meeting, so I can't imagine it it would even be close to five thousand. Actually we're we're asking for coordination of one meeting. I, and and we we would require them to provide a scope for that meeting, hourly rates, and if they do not seem in line with everything else the URA has done, then then you know we would not enter into such contract. So up to five thousand. Whatever you want to put in the thing, but yeah. I'd say up to five thousand. Okay. A second. Okay, so we so we do have a second. So Mark. Motion, Joanna seconded. The motion is to enter into a contract with, is it Pittsburgh United? You said okay. Pittsburgh United or, or the consultants or that they work the with or the combination. they work with or some combination. Okay, we can put that wording in the resolution um, for up to 5,000, not to exceed 5,000, but with the stipulation that they do provide their hourly rate and um, you know what their fee will entail and services they will perform Okay, uh, all those in favor aye. Aye. aye Anybody aye. oppose or abstain? Okay motion carries Okay, so we already did advisory board so just review and expenses commitments to date 
Um, you have the spreadsheet in front of you, which shows the programs, um, the, the colorful spreadsheet, and then there's also the <laughs> spreadsheet that um, just shows the, the uh, commitments for the rental line item. But the, the colorful spreadsheet um, shows the five programs. And we weren't really sure how to show commitments, like for something like the, the homeowner assistance program, because we have these contracts for service providers, but it's not really expending the money. I mean, we'll keep a separate spreadsheet to show the homeowners when they come in and you know when the money starts to, to leave. Um, but um, you can see sort of the commitments to date. There's been 1.8 million committed out of the rental, uh, 1.7 million to the program administrators, but not to the homeowners. Out of the homeowner assistance program, um, roughly 20,000 of commitments uh, via letters for the down payment closing costs. One of those has closed and expended. Uh, that was the first closing in Hazelwood. Um, a housing stabilization program. Uh, today, we made those commitments for the 750,000. Um, and then the for sale development program, that RFP, uh, the goal is to get that RFP out next Friday, but give us to like Monday or Tuesday of the following week, um, but it should be out in the next week and a half. And that RFP will be geared toward um, community development corporations um, to respond with their homeowner projects. And it will also be issued in cooperation with the URA's neighborhood stabilization program. program for the 50 percent versus 30 percent yeah it's evan you um, want to come up to a microphone yeah, sure. um, uh, so the um commitments made out of the 30 percent um and below set aside which was in the original allocation plan 2.5 million um uh there has been 1.4 million uh, committed to thir units at 30% uh, or below. That leaves um, a little bit over a million dollars remaining um, in that set aside. And then in that um, bracket of between 50 and 30%, it was originally 1.375 million at the um, start of the program. We've committed about 350,000 to those 50 to 30% units, and that leaves um, a little more than a million remaining in that pot. So altogether, a little over 2 million remaining in the program um, as it stands right now. Uh, no project has closed yet. We're expecting the first one, uh, Riverview Towers, to close uh, late March or early April and uh, the rest are all moving towards closing that have been committed so far. Okay, any other questions on that? There, there are several, um, we have, Evan and I have received several inquiries from developers and do anticipate a few rental projects being presented to advisory board um, next month. Under the homeowner assistance program, the 173 figure is committed. Does that include the commitment that we made or recommendation that we made today? Yeah, yeah. Doesn't, yeah. To neighborhood legal? Okay. Okay. Thank you. And how much did you want to leave for the URA? Um, um, to we originally had left 500 or thought we would leave 500,000. That's in part because I think there's 250,000 that the advisory board slated to go up to 80% AMI for emergencies for water, sewer, um, electrical. And uh, so so for us to administer that quickly, and then also we have some people that may apply to one of our other programs like HAPPY for you know accessible improvements or something where it would just make sense to use the same contractor for both scopes mm -hmm. of work. Okay, any other questions there? Okay. Um, uh, pipeline mm -hmm. for some of the, you know, uh, rental gap, and, I mean, is, is there 
I mean, how do you want us to handle that? Whenever we have a phone, like if somebody calls and tells us about their project and that in state they might be, be applying, would you like us to like keep a tally of that and give that to the advisory board? Part of this too is, is what's the demand in, in right. you know, mm -hmm. unmet demand. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. As a way, you know, if there, I know we're doing a lot of stuff and trying to do it quickly, mm -hmm. but I think that one of the points has got to be as we come back and, and talk about activity in the annual mm -hmm. report, mm -hmm. we should really be trying to capture that to say, you know, we weren't kidding when we said this didn't even fund half of yeah. the issue in, in Pittsburgh. Yep. We've got to quantify that because that's what the uh, council members voted on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that took some guts to do, but I also think we can document that. Mm -hmm. We're hearing it. So any, anything we can do to that end helps quite a bit, I think. Okay. Mark, I'm so glad you made that point um, because that's something that I uh, like to spend time on and make sure that I have enough time to spend on. Um, right now we're working on um, some data infrastructure to do just what you're saying. We will get to a point very soon where we will be able to give you a very easy report of um, exactly what stage, how many inquiries are at, and also when they tend to fall off. Um, so that we have that on a monthly basis. Um, and then at the end of the year, we will have the same kind of report. The other thing um, on the allocation issue is um, we will be able to report to you again soon, probably uh, just after the pipeline question, um, how many dollars and how many households have been served at the different area median income levels because we do take that legislated 50% uh, at 30% AMI uh, requirement very seriously. And, and also just just in general um the the calls i mean I, I can tell you that this line item this year is funding more preservation than i had originally thought that it would um a couple of the calls that we've received that will probably be they'll probably be submitting applications are um projects similar to the ones you saw last month with wood street and parkview where um, existing buildings need you know windows and elevators um, and upgrades there's a couple of those that we are aware of that that plan to come in there's also a nine percent tax credit deal that has experienced some cost increases that ha that needs to close in the next couple months and has stated that that they may be applying um, there's also a four percent tax credit deal that contacted us that um, has stated they would probably be applying I think there also might be a lag with the rental gap financing because it's only existed for so long and there's a requirement that you close really quickly. So there aren't that many projects that just have this gap that are so close to closing, but now mm -hmm. developers can plan for it in the future. So I think I think the demand for this funding source is going to increase. Yeah. L less about sort of um, specific projects that may be coming to us, but to Mark's point about understanding the pipeline as well. Um, it probably makes sense to, to have discussions with PHFA on, you know, applications that they've received, um, both for FAIR, you know, the yes. State Housing Trust Fund, et cetera, because um, my guess would be they're, they're probably oversubscribed on applications they're for that. They're way so oversubscribed on FAIR. I think they yeah. told me, like, four times oversubscribed oh, wow. on FAIR, like, the applications know, they got ba versus what they can fund. Sure. So there could be some synergy there. Yeah, yeah but one of the, you know, Conversely, and yeah. talking about people we're not hearing from um, that we're trying to find uh, to get some feedback from. You know, when we were sitting in the subcommittee, and it was with Adrian, we were talking about the number of people we were going to serve with the supportive services mm -hmm. for the year at 175. I have not seen Adrian get visibly upset until she just said, I don't want to hear that because we, if we had enough money, we could do 175 a month easily. Uh -huh. And that might be the most cost effective, one of the most cost effective mm -hmm. things we could do. Uh, so, yeah, there's a balancing and there's tremendous demand, but we need to document that stuff. And it's not going to be easy to do. But pipeline helps. Mm -hmm. Also, um, like about a year ago, we talked about a map of like all the um, affordability restricted properties that the URA was creating. Yes. Was that ever completed or was it, it possible? Is, we, <laughs> there's been a bit of a hesitancy to release it um publicly because it 
there, there, is, there could be some error factor in it. Um, it. Everybody names their projects different things. HUD might call something differently than the URA and BHFA. And we had a lot of difficulty scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing the data. Um, and we're, we're pretty confident it's probably 90% correct. And we have talked to the regional data center about possibly helping us um, publicly put this information like out on the internet somehow. Um, we're looking at that, but we are worried about the error factor to it. But I can, at the next meeting, we can show you a map, you know, that we've produced from that database where you can mm -hmm. see just in general where all the deed restricted properties are in the city. The, the other people, go ahead, sorry. In the interim, there's that national, that's right. National preservation. Well, there is, but that was part. Errors, but yeah, it's a starting point, and you can get on it today and log on and yeah. see yeah. what's it's out cool. there. I can send you the link. I can't. It's National Preservation something. And we, and we use that to help us yeah. scrub the data, but there were probably some <laughs> errors there and errors in you know publicly accessible data. So yeah, it, I mean, it is. There's there's about four to five publicly available um, data sources that. You know, a, a, a number of folks at the authority have been working to kind of reconcile and, mm -hmm. and find consistencies um, just to get to something that's sort of usable with a degree of confidence. The other piece of it is, is, is you know, there's, there's probably something that needs to be overlaid in terms of if it's put out publicly, then kind of creating um, like unnecessary sort of worry on folks as it relates so it is as an example if if the housing authority has a mixed finance project right mm -hmm. um it's not going to show up as the housing authority owning it right it's a mixed finance deal it's owned by a limited partnership etc but because of the way the deal is structured even though it may be coming to the end of its term on compliance period it's not going to convert to something that, that you know it's not going to have a risk of converting but if it was just put out there without having that additional kind of layer then someone may be unnecessarily worried that they're going to become housing unstable um, as a result of so which ones are truly at risk that's versus right which ones are expiring will probably be yeah, renewed yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's turned into a much more i think complicated and involved uh project than than any of us anticipated when the recommendation was made um to to do it but you know that's not to say that it isn't something we're striving towards okay. Um, and then I guess finally, uh, uh, just in terms of scheduling moving forward. So, you know, the schedule for the 2019 allocation plan. So we had the public meetings. We'll have the event in the, the new URA office building downtown at the end of April. Uh, what the plan, I guess, would be would be prior to that event to have the draft allocation plan in place. So I had sent out a doodle poll um, uh, that that was live for a couple of weeks and we only got less than half responses so I we picked the date of Friday um, March 15th but I am a little concerned you know that we might not be able to have all the advisory boarders many advisory board members there so I, I recognize that there's only what, like seven of you in the room right now uh, Richard and Jamil are you still on the phone yes does the 15th can people pull out their calendars? I just need to know how many people are gonna be there on the 15th. I know Sam cannot make it. I know Lena cannot make it. Um, I can make it at three, but I don't. I can't stay for a very long time, but I'll do as much work as, I, as necessary for an hour. Okay. I'm is, available. Is everybody else? Do you wanna stick yes, with the-, the Three to five works for me. Okay. I mean, I'm recognizing, I, I mean, I know Sam and Lena can be there. I don't know if we want to try for another day where everyone can be there or um, I'm willing to do whatever anybody wants. It's hard to schedule a meeting with 17 people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever, we're not all of them going to be able to be there probably. Okay, so so my hearing. Last time, what do we do? Do we have multiple meetings? I think we had two then, meetings. Yeah. Is that asking too I don't, much to have two meetings? You shouldn't have to be excluded. I'm fine with two well, meetings. It's just, just not everybody hears everything at that yeah. point. Um, but we can but then do that. Can provide feedback. I guess then they can't. We can't all vote because we're not. 
But last time they took like the mean the, yeah, median of our yeah. input yeah. anyway. It just seems like a big thing to miss if you mm -hmm. really want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, we didn't vote at the working sessions yeah. for the 18 allocation plan to, you know, to Joanna's we're, point. It was kind of like we, input and working. So we aren't all able to hear from one another, but at least then at this table um, in council chambers and, you know, on television, <laughs> we're able to discuss okay, it in an open format. Working sessions again and then come back. Um, I'm just thinking through the practicality of it. So, so you wouldn't want to cut. Like, would you want the final? Um, so, so if we have two sessions prior to the April advisory board. Then, at the April advisory board, is that when everybody kind of writes on yeah. a chart mm -hmm. as to how much money? I, I think I don't you're know doing that in both working sessions. Okay. You get you to the meeting and then, and then you, we come down and make changes here, and it is what it is. At that okay. Point but everybody's had their opportunity to get input. I think that's a good idea. Okay, mm -hmm. should we do it that way? Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But my, I guess my one question would be from the standpoint of the meetings and the surveys, are we gonna be in a position at those working session meetings where we'll have some of those answers in aggregate? Well, we were a little worried about the 15th date. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we were kind of rushing to get, I mean, Jamie, I don't wanna speak for you, but. Yeah, also, she mentioned the Housing Authority, and I want to mention something really quickly. Um, the Housing Authority approached me yesterday um, about an idea they had for a housing stabilization program, um, which would be too late to minister this year, but um, they had talked about potentially, like, would, would, would want to use some of the funding directly to help with people who have vouchers who cannot pay their rent and pay them um, through the program, and then if there were a way for them to to pay that off in the future, and I, I have no idea how people feel about this, um, but you know they would look at that um, as so to continue the funds to revolve. I don't understand. I don't understand. Okay, so <laughs> if there was someone who had a voucher who could not pay their rent that they would go directly to the housing authority. The housing authority would pay that rent. The housing authority would then basically tack that charge on, so they would pay like an additional $20 a month or whatever over the, the next however many months to repay that, is basically what the housing authority's proposal was. So that, so that the funds would then continually revolve. And they um, want money from this fund to pay that how does this fund fit in? Yeah, like to see, to be the upfront. Um, Don't they have an eviction prevention fund at I, the Housing Authority? You know, I, I, I'm not <laughs> pitching their program today. No, I, mean, I, I, I kind of brought it up just to say that maybe there's not enough time before we have to do these annual allocation plans, but, and, and Valerie just left, she's the Housing Authority representative. The Housing Authority has actually approached me about a couple other programs as well. So I don't know if it's something the advisory board would want to do where they meet with the Housing Authority and potentially some other you know, lenders and participants. Uh, DHS also has some ideas that they, they have approached us with. Um, is that something the advisory board would be interested in? We need to further explore it to understand what they're currently doing, how this yeah. plays in. But the bottom line is the housing authority residents shouldn't be excluded from help to stay in their homes, I think. And how does that get addressed is the question. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there, yeah. there are obviously all kinds of questions around it, but I just, when we talk about funding the same programs or tweaking programs or doing different programs, in addition to the Housing Authority, DHS has approached us with um, some ideas about some um, seasonal and short-term um, shelters and things like that as well. So I am sensitive to everyone is extremely busy and I try to not, you know, I try to limit the number of meetings I'm scheduling because it is hard, you know, with all your busy schedules. But 
I'm willing to set this up if people would like to have these conversations prior to, you know, funding an allocation plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe not for that session, something as complex as that, but I think we need to figure out how to do video meetings. Because I think a lot of us traveling from where we are and right. traveling back, that's like an extra hour out of the day, and maybe that's some of the reason why we can't make the Okay, I'm looking at meetings. people that are techier than me. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, if we, I mean, can we do video meetings at the URA? We could probably figure this out, right? So we will look into that because, um, yeah, no, I, I understand it's hard to make all these meetings and I absolutely. Do we want to turn the Friday meeting, since that's the first one coming up, into a meeting with funders potentially and then do one or two meetings afterwards for allocation? I'll do whatever people want. <laughs> Are they in, I guess if they're going to come to sit down especially as it relates to what the Housing Authority seems to be proposing, um, rather than just having a conversation, I mean, do they have, like, a proposal? I mean, nothing written. For, okay. And would they even be eligible since they're a public agency that we could, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm a little, I mean, I guess I understand that their idea of it sort of being revolving, and that raises a whole host of other questions I would have. Um, if they're tacking it on, quote, tacking it onto someone's bill, I'd be concerned about that um, in terms of yeah. if that can be further leveraged down the road for, <laughs> you know, eviction, et cetera. Um, setting all that aside, I mean, in the interim, if they know someone's has a, you know, is it potentially at risk, can't they just refer them to one of the providers? Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I think that's our ask of them yeah. right now. And, <laughs> and and it's not it's really not just this this particular housing stabilization program. They they have mentioned some thoughts on some other, you know, programs as well. And they, for example, they have a down payment uh closing cost program that themselves that goes with a deferred mortgage for, yeah. for first time home buyers. And I mean, I think it would be good to have meeting a meeting with them and the advisory board at some point to talk about all these things. Um yeah. Just getting clarity on how these things should align. Yes. It is mm -hmm. valuable. Okay. Okay. The question as to when that meeting should happen. I'm I'm indifferent. I'm available from three to five on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so you could do the fifteenth for that and then do the other meetings later in the month and then we'll have a lot more information. Okay. So fifteenth for the housing authority. If they can do it. And then if I send another doodle poll out, <laughs> can everybody <laughs> fill it out as soon as possible? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go with that. Because cause just backing into the timeline, if we, if we do 15th with the Housing Authority, that gives us two more weeks in March to, to schedule the allocation meetings. And then at the April advisory board, I think we are going to have several rental requests, but we can talk about what it looks like the draft is going to be, you know, based on those meetings, but not, I, I don't want to officially vote on it until May after we have the meeting, you know, with the tenant advocacy and, and so forth. Does that make sense to everybody? We'd be voting to approve on May 2nd. Yes, and going to the URA board on the 11th and then on the council the after council. that between now and May 2nd to have these sort of working sessions like we did last year to get as many members of the advisory committee sort of you know going through the process of you know, 30 50 80 percent and which programs and anything new that gets added well yeah, yeah. yes except I I would like to have a draft plan in hand to uh, to present in a public forum at, the, uh, at that meeting we have in the in the new building 
So we'll approve like a draft plan to be presented and to get more feedback. Well, on. so I'm not sure I have a strong opinion as to whether you need to approve the draft plan at the April meeting or not. Well, if we're going to vote on it in May, it could, it, we just need to have some sort of concurrence around what, what we're ready to show to the public. Yeah. Right. Some sort of occurrence. Because we're going to use that right. feedback from there to, yeah. to adjust it again. I know. So let's just say the fair housing event is April 20th. I don't, I don't know. So we would have something prior to that that, that you all agree to as a draft. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then it gets voted on finally mm -hmm. in May. Mm -hmm. Which would but, give us time. If, if we scheduled the fair housing meeting for the middle each of April, if there is, if there's, you know, 200 people at the event and people are like, well, no, you know, we don't like this. And that would give us time to revamp. Probably mid-April, like, would be better, yeah. yeah. It wasn't, like, right at the end, in right. case you have to have more conversation. That makes sense. Okay, so is that a plan? Okay, so the 15th, I will try to schedule it with the Housing Authority, and I will confirm with all of you if I can get them on the calendar for the 15th. I'll send out a doodle poll for additional dates to give us a little bit more time to get all the, the feedback together from the meetings, and uh, we'll circulate... Um, the feedback as soon as we get it done, so you have time to look at it. Do we want to invite DHS to the 15th as well? That's that depends on how convoluted the housing authority. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's almost <laughs> two <laughs> slightly <laughs> different time slots. Like yeah, if we do three, three o'clock okay. with the housing authority and four o'clock with DHS, sure. is sure. that okay? Okay. Or choice of words. Is any, I don't know where we're at here. Did, any <laughs> other business before we go to public comment? Okay. Is there any public comment from the audience? Come on up. Um, for the record, I'm Celeste Scott, Housing Justice Organizer, Housing Justice Organizer for Pittsburgh United. Um, so I had some questions about the reporting for the community meetings. I just I wasn't sure, and if I missed this, let me know. Did you track um, like people's like gender identity? Um, if folks were queer, things like things like that ability. Okay. Okay. Because. Okay. Just because I know the a lot of the housing gaps are in those, and um, I would be interested in seeing how many of those people were at the meetings. Um, and I think that's the only question that I had. Um, also, I guess we um, addressed the timeline for the RFQ. Um, so that's not a question that I had. Um, we did um, text banking, so speaking about being techie yesterday, and I got a lot of people that responded with things they wanted the advisory board to hear. Um, I'm just gonna read like one of the comments, I'm gonna do a report and get it to you. But it's from Amy Mangum, and she says, I would like the advisory board to know that she would like to see funds for low-income families that are renters in their own communities to obtain purchase power of vacant and abandoned homes and remodel them within her community. So I got homeowners, I got stakeholders, people that I know, um, because the text bank looks like it comes from me and then I answer it, so it's really cool. So I'll get that to you. Um, and the only other thing um, that I wanted to say um, is that I know for, I know Swain and Laura, um, so the, the advisory board, I don't know if you can see the name plates, but everybody has a slot that they represent for the public. So. 17 people for different slots, so I don't know, you can probably come up and read them later. Um, so I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you for doing everything, and we look forward to working with you. Um, thank you. Good morning, guys. Sorry I was late earlier. Um, woke up with almost a flat tire, so I had to go to <laughs> taken care of in order to get over here. Um, my name is Crystal Jennings. I'm with CJ Consulting, and... Um, contractor through Pittsburgh United. Okay, um, Kyle, you had asked earlier, um, how do we reach, I think it was you, how do we reach homeless people? Um, or somebody asked that question, yeah. but it was you. Teresa. Oh, okay, um, but you go where they are. 
Um, it's, it may be an uncomfortable situation, but it, you go where they are. Um, a lot of them I've met at shelters when I did my housing and transit survey. Um, you go to food pantries, you go to shelters, you go where they are. You go where they are in need of uh, supplies or amenities. So that's the answer to that. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, yeah, um, I missed the first hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> so I'm just jumping in on what we heard. But yeah, um, Celeste was able to do a uh, text baking yesterday and we got a lot of good feedback and input. Um, from thank you for your support. I'm tired, <laughs> um, and and I appreciate Swain and Laura coming yeah. to support us. Um, they came to our housing table yesterday, so we're trying to, yeah, it was packed uh, 19 people, but we're trying to bring more people to these meetings so that way they know what's going on. Because like I stated before, we have been getting a lot of questions, concerns, mm -hmm. and comments um, that I know, Vatina, you had suggested that we give it to you. Um, but we're still getting them. We probably still want to get them. So, um, but right. So we just want to make sure that you guys are able to see some of the constituents and mm -hmm. some of the people that um, that maybe um, having issues with something in their lives or may know someone who's coming here to get the information that they can also pass out to the communities. So thank you all for what? Oh, I was saying Hazelwood came yesterday. Yeah, a lot of, we had a lot of, a lot of people that came out to our housing table yesterday. Um, Hazelwood and um, all types of other um, areas, Bloomfield, Gulf Road. Um, yeah, so just know that we're going to, we're trying to pack this room to get the community input or just involved mm -hmm. with the situation um, instead of it just being just a handful of us each time. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate you guys sitting here for almost three hours mm -hmm. and um, looking forward to continue working with you guys. Thank you. I forgot one thing. It's an outreach thing. I'll say it quickly. So we are working with, and Jessica's on the panel on the 12th, um, but we're doing our own um, working with Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts to do a landlord-tenant workshop on the 14th at Pittsburgh United from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So, Bettina, I don't know if you want to come out. We, um, we're partnering with us, Northside Coalition for Fair Housing, um, Landless People's Alliance, and Bob is helping us, but he's not a on the flyer, but there's gonna be a housing lawyer Q&A. So um, I invite you to come out and we're gonna be talking to people about everything. Okay. Can, you, can you repeat those details? So. Oh, I'm sorry. It'll be on March 14th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Pittsburgh United, which is 841 California Avenue, 15212. Um, and it will be a landlord tenant workshop run by Pennsylvanians for a modern court. Judge Ravenstall will be moderating. Um, and Bob will be doing, and other housing lawyers, a Q&A at the end. So you're all invited. Yes. Uh, it's also on our Facebook. We also have a Facebook event. And Celeste, the one that we're speaking at um, next week, do you know the date and the time yes. of that? Yes, so that one is March 12th um, at Bloomfield Garfield Community Center, which I believe is 112 North Pacific, 113, okay. Yeah, okay. one five two two four, and Judge Pappas will be moderating, and then Jessica and I are on a panel, and um, Pennsylvanians for a Modern Court will be doing the workshop. So those are happening um, out in the community to to get people out, and so um, it's an opportunity for the House Opportunity Fund as well to come um, and meet people. Um, also, I think the idea about magistrates is really good, so I'm hoping that we will filter the resources to magistrates as well. So okay, I'm done now. <laughs> you don't have to leave, but um, I'm Carol, and I'm with the Hill District Consensus Group. And just to back um, Celeste up, we have a renter's rights workshop, and we're working with the Pennsylvania and Modern Court as well. We had a great turnout, um, judges. We had judges, um, magistrates. We had landlords. Mm -hmm. We had residents. And they packed that Hill House Auditorium mm -hmm. on the coldest night that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm saying that, I'm going to work backwards, because the problem with homeless, we have to get some policies in place like just cause evictions and um, also 
get the um, whole court system and everyone to be on the same page because um, we did a survey about how many people get evicted per year and it would scare you. So that means people are getting evicted and most of the magistrates and judges, they said they really don't want to evict people unless they didn't pay their rent. Right. But some of it, um, it's not enough, um, I guess, understanding between the landlords and the, the people that are actually renters. And then sometimes there's some social services components. A lot of things are missing. So I wanted to work backwards um, and um, start with the rental because I do usually be here or speaking on behalf of rentals renters but today i'm speaking on behalf of homeowners um thank everyone for coming out to grace memorial church last week i did my best to get people out did there a, there did was a great like, job thank you there was like and you know here i am and i'm the spokesperson right now to try to um, give you the feedback besides the feedback that some people were able to give you. Mm -hmm. And I think number one on the list is you need some sort of real income model. I think that AMI just is not cutting it. For instance, if you, and I've been trying to work with Bob on that, and I went to my economic professor. He <laughs> said, Carl, you have to speak to real income because real income doesn't wages doesn't keep up with inflation so without going back to economics i said okay it makes sense because under the real income then it'll capture what people are really paying out and for instance like a lot of the homeowners they felt like well we're at we're working we're at the incomes but we're either over income but all our housing expenses are adding up past our our income. So I said, yeah, that's interesting, you know, because a lot of homeowners been in their homes or inherited their homes. And so now um, they have to do a lot of repairs, but with, they're also probably on their way to retirement. And then a lot of them said, we didn't have time to build wealth. Like everyone's saying, building wealth with this homeowner stuff. We've really been taking care of family members mm -hmm. in these homes. We've really been trying to still um, get to work every day. And then another in interesting thing that came out of it was um, <clears throat> a lot of people are concerned since they probably do take care of parents or whatnot, but if you don't watch and if you get caught up with the waiver program with Allegheny County, you can lose your home. Just a mm -hmm. whole lot. And I want to capture that um, if I can and make a report because I know you tried to capture it, but I'm still getting a lot, a lot of feedback from mm -hmm. that. And then they, the biggest thing was student loan debt. Yeah. And, um, you know, you want to go into retirement. You want to hold on to what you have. Mm -hmm but the de it's just too much debt. And I think the biggest thing that came out of where people were mad and y'all were there, um, they felt like you were willing to help first time home owners from out of the city and invite them in and not help them stay in their homes. And so that was like a double whammy. And then the other double whammy was you're willing to help developers, especially community developers that are really like one day they're developers, but they're real estate people and they're scooping up houses and flipping then the people that want to stay in their home. So I said, wow, this is interesting. I said, normally I do stand and advocate for renters, mm -hmm. but you know, um, one woman said, now I'm a homeowner, and um, if this is the case, I won't even be able to become a renter because there's a shortage. So <laughs> it's, 
I said, okay, we're going, we're going, I'm going to feed this back and we're going to get this together. But it's just a lot of things that maybe the housing um, opportunity fund could be a good vehicle, but it needs to speak to policy. It needs to speak to people, right. you know, and it needs to stop placing development over people. Because as you know, and Jessica know, the choice neighborhood in the hill People are disappointed about that. I don't even want to start there because the issue was too much development. Now, you know the hill's vacant. You could build wherever you want. And that was the issue all the time around the table instead of saying, oh, how do we get make people whole? So, you know, a lot of it, I wrote notes here and there, and I know we have to go, but my, my last suggestion is since Pittsburgh United and myself, and different ones, we do the boots on the ground and get people out there. And so mm -hmm. I, a lot of times mm -hmm. I'll run into people and they'll say, well, Carol, I'll help you and I'll just give them money out my pocket. And I said, maybe this fund can, you know, be used to help people and the residents and they would be able to educate, mm -hmm. door knock, and do all that stuff, and finally take pride and be stewardships. You know, yeah, yeah, and so, you know, but like for me, a lot of us, our funding is short, so, you know, but I do what I can because I know that's rough, but um, there's people that want to be involved. And finally, this, I almost forget this. When you're talking AMI and this, a lot of people didn't know what you were talking yeah, about. Okay. So we have to That's be fair. clear about maybe, like I'm around the table really telling people this is what yes. they mean, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And um, they just didn't understand um, the language until it got to the numbers and they seen where their incomes yeah. were. And they felt like, I don't need help with light and gas. I really need a roof. I really need this and that, mm -hmm. you know? And so mm -hmm. I'm, yes. I'm willing to work on behalf because we have to start making people whole um, with the money, especially like the homeowner said, their tax dollars put in to the to all of this and yeah. this is what they get thank you thank you and and just one quick comment um because i thought you brought some great great things up and one one thing that we've been thinking about since these these public meetings especially the meeting in the hill is for the folks that are just slightly higher than 50 percent mm -hmm. ami um you know the hof is governed by legislation that dictates the income levels to a, a mm -hmm. certain extent but um through this process, we, we would really like to, to take it a step further and look at how they, they work in conjunction, HOF programs work in conjunction with other URA programs, because we do have some other URA consumer programs that can address slightly higher income. And, you know, it's, it's, maybe it's time, it's probably time to, to relook at those and, and revamp those and to figure out with how to put them together person for real because you know I go over Sam you all the time and I sit at their feet but you know they're over there making a lot of sense for a lot of things and yep. I'm not trying to put anyone down but they're like Carl you have to understand the government is behind and they you know don't want to admit it we're here so I think there has to be that day because I'm gonna keep on pushing for that real income till I figure that out, you know, and but one thing the, I would it's say, just time. <laughs> you look at this team over here, we got some really oh, smart I'm not, I'm techie not, policy I'm not, people not, over here yeah. that is helping us kind of take that next leap and really looking at that, wants to look at the data. Jamie, I don't want to speak for you or, or Evan, but, but you guys really want to look at the data we start producing and figure out how to make, you know, good policy decisions moving forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick, I promise. Um, just a couple of different things. First of all, the committee meetings and working groups, are those going to be public, and is there a way other than either physically coming or give, coming to those meetings to give input on how you think those... Those meetings will probably be held at the URA, just in terms of meeting space, but we can list them publicly. And related to that, um, people were talking about live streaming various meetings. Facebook works, like 
people watch Facebook Live, social media actually does reach certain categories, obviously not everyone. Um, so I do think it is something that is worth looking into and it's the easiest thing in the world. Okay. You could probably um, just have a you little... Can, you can literally... I could have my phone. Fun. I could live stream this whole thing <laughs> yeah. and people could watch it and it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Um, so th those two things. Um, eviction defense is something for this coming year, I think, is people, you, you really need to take a look at. People getting pushed out of the city, can't, or have no longer, act, you know, don't have access to this anymore if they're outside of the city. Um, it's a huge problem, uh, especially in the East End, I know, uh, which is related to my next point. And I know you, you're, you take it into consideration, you're very diligent and measured about how you make sure every area has you know, some funding and these sorts of programs addressing their needs. The East End is very big, obviously, and I do think just even looking at the maps and at the various maps at the meetings, Homewood is often left out, um, and it's in the crosshairs. Homewood is next. We all know that. After East Liberty, we've seen what's happened, and slowly, day by day, people are getting pushed out of Homewood, you know, getting pushed down to Wilmerdine or wherever else where it's and it, you can't get to your doctor, you can't get to work, you can't do anything out there. Um, so just keeping in mind, don't forget Homewood. Thanks. And, and actually, can you come back up and say your name because oh, yeah. we need it uh, for the minutes. My name is Swain Uber. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Push Should it I? to adjourn. Push that <laughs> second. Yeah.